Section 41 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Louis Hoffman. Miscellaneous Tricks, Part 8. To fire borrowed rings from a pistol and make them pass into a goblet filled with bran and covered with a handkerchief, the bran disappearing and being found elsewhere. The glass used in this instance is of ordinary tumbler size. It is not brought forward as above, with the bran shape already in place, but empty and may therefore be freely offered for inspection. With it is brought forward a wooden box of any size and shape filled with bran, and in this, ready to hand, is concealed the bran shape. We have already had occasion to describe the magic pistol, or rather pistol tube, but the tube used in this instance, see figure 217, has an additional peculiarity. It is of comparatively small size, being about two inches wide at the mouth. Within this mouth fits easily a tin cup, A, about an inch and three quarters in depth, and having its edge turned over outwards all around, so as to afford a ready grip to the palm when it may be necessary to remove it. The pistol is beforehand loaded with powder, and the cup above described is placed in the mouth of the tube. The performer begins by asking the loan of three rings to be fired from his magic pistol. To preclude the possibility of their being exchanged, he requests the owners to drop them into the pistol themselves. First, however, by way of wad, he takes a small piece of white paper and presses its center portion into the mouth of the pistol tube, its edges projecting all round and forming a sort of cup to receive the rings. Three rings having been offered and dropped into the pistol, the performer closes over the edges of the paper and presses them down with his wand, the effect being as if the rings were fairly rammed down into the pistol, though they really remain in the cup just within the mouth. He now hands the pistol to one of the spectators, requesting him to hold it muzzle upwards above his head. In handing it to him, he places for a moment his own right hand over the mouth of the tube, his palm being flat upon it, and in again removing the hand, lifts out and palms the cup, which the projecting edge enables him to do with perfect ease. He has thus obtained possession of the rings. As the holder of the pistol has been instructed to hold it above his head, he is not very likely to look into it, but lest he should do so and discover that the rings are already removed, it is well to place in the tube beforehand a piece of crumpled white paper to represent that which contained the rings. The performer now hands round the glass for examination, and subsequently draws attention to the box of bran. While doing this, he has little difficulty in getting the rings out of the cup and paper into his right hand. He then, holding the glass in his left hand, dips it into the box and fills it with bran, which he forthwith pours slowly back again to prove its genuineness. Meanwhile, his right hand is engaged in fishing up the bran shape among the bran, placing it mouth upwards in the box and dropping the rings into it. When he again dips the glass into the box, he slips it mouth downwards over the shape, immediately turning it into the natural position and bringing it up, to all appearance full of bran as the rings were in the shape they are of course now in the glass he brushes the loose bran off the top and then covers the glass with a borrowed handkerchief taking particular notice on which side hangs the loop of thread the person holding the pistol is now requested to take good aim and fire at the glass he does so and the performer lifting the handkerchief with the shape within it lets the latter drop on the servante and advancing with the glass, requests the owners to identify their rings. The trick may either end here, upon the supposition that the bran has been blown away altogether by the explosion, or the bran may be shown to have passed into some other place. There are numerous methods of effecting this latter transposition. For instance, the pea vase, see page 351, first shown empty, may be used, or the bran may be made to fall out of a second borrowed handkerchief by means of the bag shown on page 248, or may be found in the apparatus next described. 
the domino box sometimes called the glove box this is a little oblong box of walnut or rosewood measuring about four inches in length by two inches in width and an inch and a quarter in depth it has a sliding lid drawing out in the ordinary manner but the whole box has a tightly fitting inner lining which may be pulled out drawer fashion with the lid see figure 218 it is used as follows any small article say a glove or a lady's handkerchief is secretly placed inside this inner lining the performer exhibits the box to the company and to show that it is empty turns it over towards them and draws the lid nearly out drawing out with it at the same time the inner lining or drawer also see figure 219 from the position of the box the drawer is at a very short distance completely hidden by the lid the box is of course seen to be perfectly empty the performer now closes it and turning its right side upwards places it on the table he then proceeds with the next stage of the trick and at the right moment again opens the box or invites someone else to do so this time the lid alone is drawn out and the hidden article is found in the box there is another specialty about the domino box which renders it available to cause the disappearance of a coin placed in it though as in the case of the rattle box described in the chapter devoted to coin tricks the coin is heard to rattle within it till the very moment of its disappearance this is effected as follows between the bottom of the drawer and that of the proper box is a very small space just large enough to allow a shilling to lie between the true and false bottom on the underside of the drawer however see figure 220 showing the underside of the drawer portion are glued two thin strips of wood gradually approaching each other and thereby narrowing this space to a width of about half an inch if when the lid is withdrawn with the drawer as already explained a shilling or sovereign is dropped into the box and the box again closed the coin will have plenty of room to rattle about as long as it remains at the end a but if shaken down with a sharp jerk in the direction of the end b it will become caught in the narrower portion of the opening and will thenceforth be silent unless it may suit the purpose of the performer to release it again which he can do by a sharp downward jerk in the direction of a of course as the coin is below the false bottom it will appear to have vanished when the box is opened in the ordinary way the domino box is sometimes used to change a sovereign to its equivalent in silver this change being beforehand wrapped in paper and concealed in the drawer it is sometimes also caused to fill itself with bonbons in place of a coin deposited in it these boxes are usually made in pairs alike in appearance but the one is a simple box without any speciality and may therefore be handed round for examination the mechanical box being adroitly substituted at the right moment the fact that two boxes are used is of course carefully concealed the coffee trick coffee berries changed to hot coffee white beans to sugar and bran to hot milk the pieces of apparatus used in this trick are of brass or japanned tin and are three in number two being tall cylindrical vases standing eighteen to twenty inches in height the third a goblet-shaped vase of about half that height the latter is made upon the principle of the bran glass above described consisting of three portions see figure two hundred twenty one the goblet a the cover c and a shallow tray b which fits into the goblet and which if the cover is pressed down smartly and again removed is lifted off with it it differs however from the brand shape in the fact that b is open at top instead of at bottom and is only about one-fifth the depth of the goblet leaving therefore considerable space below it this portion of the apparatus is prepared for use by placing in the goblet a quantity of hot milk putting b in position above it and finally filling b with loose bran the construction of the two other vases will be quickly understood upon an inspection of figures two hundred twenty two and two hundred twenty three a is the vase and c the cover fitting loosely over it but between these two is a well b made double so as to fit at once into and outside of a 
after a mode of construction which we have more than once had occasion to notice. There is a bayonet catch at the lower edge of C, corresponding with a pin or stud at the lower edge of B, so that C may be lifted off either with or without B. There is a similar catch at the lower edge of B, corresponding with a stud at the bottom of A, but cut in the opposite direction to the other catch, so that the action of unlocking A from B locks B to C, and vice versa. The vase A requires a special description. A shallow saucer of tin, D, just fits the interior of the vase, working up and down there in piston fashion, but prevented from coming out altogether by the fact that the upper edge of A is slightly turned inwards all around. Below D is a spiral spring, whose action tends to force D to the top of the vase, as shown in figure 222. From the center of D, however, there extends downwards through the spiral spring a piece of stiff wire E, with a crook F at the end. The foot of the vase is hollow throughout. If the saucer D is forced down by pressure from within, this wire, as soon as it reaches the position shown in figure 223, will hook itself within the foot of the vase, and so keep down D, until the crook is again released, when the hole will instantly return to the condition shown in figure 222. The bottom of the foot is open, so that the fingers can without difficulty find and release the crook when necessary. The vases are prepared by pressing down D in each, as shown by the dotted lines in figure 223, and filling the well of the one with hot coffee, and that of the other with loaf sugar. Their respective covers are then placed over them. The attention of the audience is first directed to a couple of wooden boxes, each about half as long again as the vases, and ten or twelve inches in depth, one of which is filled with coffee berries, and the other with white haricot beans. The performer now uncovers the vase which contains the coffee, first turning the bayonet catch so as to lift off the well B with the cover, and shows, by holding the vase upside down and rattling his wand within it, that it is perfectly empty. He now fills it with coffee berries, laying it down in the box to do so, and holding it by the foot with one hand while he shovels the berries into it with the other. Having completely filled it with berries, he holds it aloft and to show that there is no deception, tilts it, and lets them run back again into the box. Again he dips it into the box, but, as he does so, releases the crook, which the fingers of the hand holding the vase are just in position to do, and thus lets D fly up to the top of the vase. Again he brings up the vase, apparently full as before, but really having only a mere layer of berries, of the depth of D, at the top. He now puts on the cover, the well in which again forces D and the superposed layer of coffee berries down to make way for it, and causes the crook again to catch beneath the hollow of the foot. The same operation is now gone through with the vase whose well contains the sugar and the box of white beans. The performer lastly takes from the third vase a handful of bran, which he scatters to show its genuineness, and then places the cover over it. The trick is now really completed. On removing the respective covers, taking care of course first to turn the bayonet catches in the right direction, the wells are released from the covers and locked to the vases, which are thus found full respectively of hot coffee and sugar, and, on removing the cover of the third vase, the bran is lifted off with it and the milk is revealed. Some coffee vases, and more particularly those of French make, dispense with the bayonet catch, replacing it by a peculiar arrangement inside the top of the cover. The upper edge of the well is slightly turned in all round, and the turning of the knob at the top of the cover causes three flat bolts or catches to shoot out circularly from the edges of a hollow disc, soldered to the top of the cover inside, and insert themselves under this projecting edge. See figures 224-225. The mechanical arrangement by which this is effected is almost impossible to explain in writing, though it becomes readily intelligible upon an actual inspection of the apparatus, and will be understood without much difficulty 
after a slight study of the above diagrams, the arrow in each case indicating the direction in which the knob must be turned, in order to bring the bolts into the condition shown in the opposite diagram. The Inexhaustible Box The inexhaustible box is, to all outward appearance, a plain wooden box, of walnut, mahogany, or rosewood, in length from twelve to twenty inches, and in depth and width from nine to fifteen inches. Whatever its dimensions, its width and depth, exclusive of the lid, must be alike. To prove that it is without preparation within, the performer turns it over on the table towards the spectators, and, lifting the lid, shows that it is perfectly empty. Again he closes it, and, turning it right side upwards, opens it once more, and instantly proceeds to take from it a variety of different articles. At any moment the box is again turned over towards the audience, and shown to be empty, but it is no sooner replaced than the performer recommences taking from it toys, bonbons, etc., the supply being many times larger than could possibly be contained at one time in the box. The bottom of AB of the box, see figure 226, is movable, working on a hinge B extending along its front. When the box is turned over to the front, this bottom piece does not turn over with it, but remains flat upon the table as before. A piece of wood, BC, of exactly similar size and shape, is glued to AB at right angles. When the box stands right side upwards, this piece lies flat against the front of the box, whose upper edge is made with a slight return so as to conceal it. When the box is turned over to the front, this piece, like the bottom, retains its position, while any object which had previously been placed in the box remains undisturbed but hidden by this latter piece. See figures 226, 227. It is, of course, necessary that each object should be of such a size as not to overpass the arc which the edge of the box describes in its change of position, and the length from B to C must be exactly the same as that from A to B. The mode of using the box will require little explanation. Any number of objects, not overpassing the limits we have mentioned, may be placed in the box, which, being then turned over, can be shown apparently empty. The box being replaced in its normal position, the articles are again within it, and can be produced at pleasure. The effect of inexhaustibility is produced as follows. Each time that the performer turns over the box to show that it is empty, he takes from the servante, or from his pockets, and places upon AB a fresh supply of articles to be produced as soon as the box is again right side upwards. It should be mentioned that the hinge at B is made to act freely, so that the bottom may by its own weight retain its position when the box is turned over, and not turn over with the box. Some boxes are made with a catch or pin at some part of A, so as to prevent AB falling prematurely, while the box is being placed on the table, or while the performer carries round the box and shows that, inside and out, it is without preparation. This, however, the performer may safely do, even without the use of any catch or fastening, by taking care to grasp the box, when carrying it, by its front edge, with his fingers inside it. The fingers will thus press BC closely against the front of the box, and will thereby effectually prevent AB from shifting its position. The box is, of course, in the case supposed, really empty. The performer has therefore to make an opportunity for introducing what may be needful into it. This he may do by remarking, as he replaces it upon the table, You are by this time, ladies and gentlemen, tolerably well satisfied that there is nothing in this box, but for the greater satisfaction of those who may not have been able to see the interior as I carried it around, I will once more show you that it is absolutely empty. So saying, he turns it over, and once more shows the interior, at the same time placing on A-B whatever article he designs to produce. End of section 41
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Mancy. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Brian Mancy VO. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Louis Hoffman. Miscellaneous Tricks, Part 9. The Japanese Inexhaustible Boxes. This is a form of the same apparatus in which an additional element of mystery is produced by the use of a box within a box. The inner box is an ordinary inexhaustible box, as last described, but made with a flat wooden lid instead of the hollow or box lid used in the older form of the trick. The outer box just fits over the inner and is, in fact, a mere cover for it, being an ordinary wooden box save that it has no front. The two are brought on one within the other. The performer begins by taking the smaller box, which is ready filled with the objects to be produced, completely out of the larger, and shows that the latter is absolutely empty. He then places the two boxes together, as shown in figure 228, turning over the smaller box to show its interior, as already described. After this is done, the smaller box is tilted back to its normal position within the larger, the lid of the latter being slightly lifted to allow it to pass, and then both lids being opened together. The production of the contents commences. The function of the larger box is, in fact, merely to act as a screen to hinder the part of the smaller, when turned over towards the audience. The only advantage of the Japanese over the ordinary box is that it may be worked on any table and with spectators on all sides, but this advantage is counterbalanced by the drawback that nothing can be produced save what was originally in the box, neither can the smaller box be carried round and shown empty. This, however, may be met by beginning the trick with the two boxes together, and then, after having brought to light the whole of the original contents, offering, for the pretend purpose of heightening the effect, to continue the trick without the aid of the outer box. The inner box may thenceforth be replenished from behind, in the same way as the ordinary inexhaustible box. The inexhaustible box is frequently made the vehicle for those distributions of bonbons, toys, etc., which to the juvenile mind form by no means the least attractive feature of a magical performance. It is also available for the production of flowers, multiplying balls, goblets, bird cages, and the miscellaneous assortment of articles generally associated with hat tricks. One of the most effective modes of using it is in connection with the very pretty trick next following. The Feast of Lanterns. The performer, having exhibited the box empty as already described, turns it over again, and instantly produces from it a paper lantern of many colours, with a lighted candle in it. This he hands to his assistant or one of the company, to hang up at some convenient part of the stage or room, and returning to the box produces another, and yet another, till ten or twelve or even a larger number have been produced, the box being every now and then turned over to prove it empty. The effect of a number of lanterns thus mysteriously produced from an empty box and hung about the stage in all directions is most brilliant. As the candles do not burn very long and there may be some risk of the lanterns catching fire, it is well to make this trick the finale of the entertainment and to allow the curtain to fall before the illumination has had time to lose its effect. A great part of the effect of the trick lies in the very considerable bulk of the lanterns three or four of which would apparently be more than sufficient to fill a box from which a dozen or so are produced. This arises from the construction of the lanterns themselves, which are of the kind used for Christmas trees and illuminations, and when open offer a considerable cylindrical surface, though when closed they are little more than flat discs. They are placed in the box in the condition shown in the last mentioned figure, but when lifted out by the wire at top at once expand, Constantina fashion, and assume the shape shown in figure 229, they are lighted in sundry ways, one method being as follows. Each lantern contains about three quarters of an inch of candle, from which the wick has been removed, and a wax match inserted in its stead. Against the front of the box, or rather against the wooden flap BC, is glued a tablet D of sandpaper upon which to strike the match, and a gentle rub against this instantly lights the candle when the lantern is immediately lifted out, as already explained. There is, however, an improvement whereby the lanterns are not only made to occupy much less space, but may be lighted simultaneously, 
In this case, the little cylinder which forms the socket for the candle, and which should be about half an inch in diameter, instead of occupying the middle of the space at the bottom of the lantern, is placed at one side of such space. One of the lanterns, that which is to be the undermost when they are grouped together, has no further preparation but the second, by the side of its own socket, has a round hole in the bottom, just large enough to give room for the socket of the first. The next, or third lantern, has two holes, allowing the passage of the sockets of the first and second. The fourth has three holes, the fifth four, the sixth five, the seventh sixth, and the eighth seven so that when the lanterns are placed one upon another in proper order, the sockets of the lower lanterns come up in a circle through the holes in the bottom of the uppermost one. The tops and bottoms are made of tin, which is not only safe from catching fire, but occupies very little space. In this case, the original wicks of the candles are retained, but are slightly moistened with turpentine to render them instantly inflammable, and are lighted by a lucifer or wax match struck in the ordinary way the merest touch sufficing to ignite them. They may then be lifted out in rapid succession with great effect. A group of six or eight lanterns thus prepared may be produced from a borrowed hat, being previously concealed in the breast or tail pocket of the performer, and loaded into the hat at any convenient opportunity. It is desirable in this case to have a friction tablet glued upon the top of the uppermost lantern to strike the match upon, as the hat lining is hardly adapted for that purpose. The lanterns above described are the most generally used and are by much the easiest to manipulate. There is, however, a spherical lantern also obtainable at the toy shops, which has a decidedly prettier effect. This form of lantern is, when shut up, as shown in figure 231. To develop it, the wires A and B are each made to describe a semicircle, as shown by the dotted line, bringing the whole into the condition shown in figure 232 in which condition it is maintained by slipping the loop of A under B. The best plan for lighting in this case is to have a separate small piece of candle, prepared with a match wick as above mentioned, placed in readiness on the servante, and a small pin or sharp nail projecting upwards from the bottom of the box to act as a candlestick. The candles in the lantern will in this case need no special preparation. The performer first lights the prepared candle by rubbing it against the tablet, and then presses it down upon the upright pin we have mentioned. The other candles are in turn lighted from this, each lantern being put into shape before being lifted out of the box, which must in this case be of tolerable size in order to admit of their ready development. The Butterfly Trick This is a trick of Japanese origin, which became very popular two or three years since. In effect, it is as follows. The performer brings forward an ordinary fan, and a couple of bits of tissue paper, each torn into a fanciful likeness of a butterfly. Taking these upon his hand, he gently fans them, the motion of the air speedily causing them to rise above his head. Still gently fanning them, he causes them to hover, now high, now low, now fluttering along the wall, now descending into a gentleman's hat, whence they presently emerge to again flutter hither and thither at his pleasure. The point that most strikes an attentive observer is the fact that, whether they fly high or low, the butterflies always keep together. Sometimes they may be a couple of feet apart, sometimes only a few inches, but they never exceed the above limit, and the spectator naturally concludes that an extraordinary degree of dexterity must be necessary to enable the performer to keep them from diverging more widely. Here, however, in truth lies the secret of the trick which is that the so-called butterflies are connected by a piece of very fine silk a couple of feet in length, which, when the butterflies are in motion, is absolutely invisible to the spectators. The remainder of the trick is a matter of practice, though it is less difficult than would be imagined by anyone who had never attempted it. Some performers have the silk thread attached to one of the buttons of the coat. This arrangement will be found greatly to facilitate the working of the trick. The paper for the butterflies is better torn than cut, and should be as nearly as possible of the shape of St George's Cross, and about two inches square. The Wizard's Omelet, borrowed rings and live doves produced from an omelet. This is a trick which always produces a great sensation, whether performed upon the stage or in the drawing room. Its effect is as follows. The performer produces either naturally or magically, e.g. from the egg bag or from the mouth of Mrs. Assistant, as described at page 329, three eggs which he hands round for examination. 
His assistant next borrows from the audience three ladies' rings, receiving them in order to prove that he does not tamper with them in any way, on the performer's wand instead of in his hands. The wand, with the ring still upon it, is laid upon the table. The assistant next brings in an omelette pan and places it, with its lid beside it, on the table. The performer breaks the eggs into it, dropping in shells and all, then pours some spirits over it, to which he sets fire and while it is still blazing, drops the rings from the wand into it. He brings it forward to show that the rings are really in the flames, and on returning to his table, claps the cover on the pan, and fires a pistol, any ordinary pistol, over it, without a moment's interval. He again removes the cover. All traces of the omelette and eggshells have vanished, but in their place are found three live doves, each with a ribbon round its neck, to which is attached one of the borrowed rings, the explanation of this surprising result is simplicity itself. The reader, with his present knowledge, will readily conjecture that, as to the rings, a substitution is effected, but he may not so easily guess the manner of such substitution. It will be remembered that the rings were collected by the assistant on the performer's wand. This arrangement, which is ostensibly adopted to prevent, in reality facilitates an exchange. The assistant makes his collection with three dummy rings placed beforehand on the lower end of the wand, and concealed by the hand in which he holds it, which we will suppose is the right hand. In returning to the stage, he takes hold with the left hand of the opposite end of the wand, and allows the borrowed rings to run down into that hand, at the same moment releasing the dummy rings from the right hand, and allowing them to run upon the middle of the wand in place of the others. He now has the borrowed rings in his left hand, and, laying the wand with the substitutes on the table, carries them off with him to prepare for the denouement of the trick. The only other matter which will require explanation is the construction of the omelette pan. This is a shallow pan of brass or tin, about ten inches in diameter by two and a half in depth. Within this is an inner pan, also of brass or tin, fitting tightly within it, but about half an inch less in depth. The lid is made with a very deep rim or shoulder all round, and just fits within the lining, though less tightly than the latter fits within the pan. See figure 233, in which A represents the pan, B the lining, and C the lid. The assistant, as soon as he gets behind the scenes, loops the borrowed rings to the ribbons, which are already tied round the necks of the three doves, and places the latter in it, immediately putting on C, the two together having the appearance of a simple cover and brings forward the pan and cover. The performer now makes his omelette and drops the substitute rings into it. In bringing forward the pan to show that the rings are really there, he takes care to avoid the owners of them, who would alone be likely to detect the substitution. When he claps on the cover, the trick is really done, the firing of the pistol being merely for effect. When the cover is again removed, the lining remains in the pan, concealing the omelette beneath it, and revealing the doves with the rings attached to their necks. The rose in the glass vase, the ingenious piece of apparatus which we are about to describe, was, we believe, the invention of Robert Houdin. It consists of a glass vase, on a foot, and with a glass lid, standing altogether eight to ten inches in height. This is placed on a square box-like plinth or pedestal, of wood covered with morocco, and measured in about eight inches square by six in height. The lid is placed upon the vase, which, being transparent, is clearly seen to be empty. A borrowed handkerchief is for a moment thrown over the hole, and again removed when a handsome rose, natural or artificial, is seen to have mysteriously found its way into the vase, whence it is removed and handed to the company for inspection. The secret of this mysterious appearance is twofold, lying partly in the vase and partly in the pedestal. The vase, which at a little distance appears as simple and commonplace as any in a confectioner's window, has a segment cut off one side, leaving an opening of about five inches in height by three and a half in width. See figure 234. This opening is kept turned away from the audience. The pedestal, like the vase, is closed on every side except the side remote from the spectators, which is open. A curved wire arm, with a clip at the end to receive the stalk of the rose, works up and down, describing a quarter of a circle in this open space. A spring hinge on which this arm works impels it to assume the position shown in the figure, thus lifting the rose through the opening into the vase. 
The apparatus is set by forcing down the arm with the rows into the position indicated by the dotted lines, in which position it is retained by a little catch until the performer, in the act of covering the vase with a handkerchief, presses a stud at the upper side of the pedestal. This withdraws the catch and allows the rose to rise into the vase. Of course, the performer, in taking out the flower, does so from the top and with proper precautions not to disclose the existence of the opening at the back of the vase. The ingenuity of the reader will probably suggest to him combinations to make the trick more effective. To those who have not such ready invention, we may remark that the trick may be very effectively combined with that of the ball that changes to a rose, and vice versa. See page 300. Or a duplicate rose may be placed in the mouchoir de dial, described at page 195, and thence ordered to pass to the vase. End of section 42. Recording by Brian Mancy. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash brianmancyvo. Section 43 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Blazely Dragon. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring, by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Miscellaneous Tricks, Part 10. The Chinese Rings. These are rings of brass or steel, in diameter from 5 to 9 inches and in thickness varying from a quarter to three-eighths of an inch. The effect of the trick to the spectator is as follows. The rings are given for examination, and found to be solid and separate. But at the will of the operator, they are linked together in chains of two, three, or more, becoming connected and disconnected in a moment, and being continually offered for examination. Finally, after the rings have become involved in apparently inextricable mass, a slight shake suffices to disentangle them and to cause them to fall singly upon the stage. The sets of rings sold at the conjuring depots vary in number, ranging from six to twelve. The set of eight, which is perhaps the most usual number, consists of one key ring, two single rings, a set of two linked together, and a set of three linked together. The key ring, in which lies the secret of the trick, is simply a ring with a cut or opening in it, for use upon a public stage, where the performer is at a considerable distance from his audience. There may be a gap of an eighth of an inch between the ends, but for drawing room use, they should just touch each other. Some rings are made to clip like an earring, and some have the opening cut diagonally instead of square, but the simple square cut is, in our opinion, the best. We shall in the first place Describe the trick as performed with the set of eight rings above mentioned, afterwards noticing the more elaborate performance with twelve. We must premise, however, that the manipulation of the rings admits of almost infinite variation, and that the practice of performers differs greatly as to the mode of working with them. The performer comes forward, holding the eight rings in his left hand, arranged as follows. First, and innermost, comes the set of three, then the key ring, then the set of two, and lastly, the two single rings. Taking the first of these, he hands it to a spectator for examination, passing it when returned to another person, and carelessly handing a second ring to be examined in like manner. This should be done without any appearance of haste, and with an air of being perfectly indifferent as to how many of the rings are examined. The two singles have been duly inspected. The performer requests one of the spectators to take them both in his right hand, at the same time taking his own right hand with the next two rings, which will be remembered as the set of two, though the audience naturally believes them to be like the first, separate. Now, sir, the professor continues, will you be good enough to link one of the rings which you hold into the other? The person addressed looks more or less foolish and finally gives it up. You can't, says the performer in pretend surprise. My dear sir, nothing is easier. You have only to do as I do. See? Laying down the rest of the rings, he holds the two as in figure 236 
and makes a gentle rubbing motion with the thumb upon the rings, and then lets fall one of them, which naturally drops into the position shown in figure 237. He now hands these two rings for examination. The spectators seek for some joint or opening, but none is found. And meanwhile, the performer transfers the next ring, the key, to his right hand, keeping the opening under the thumb. He now takes back with the left hand the two single rings, immediately transferring one of them to the right hand and with the ball of the thumb presses it through the opening in the key ring into which it falls, with exactly the same effect as the apparent joining of the two linked rings a moment before. Again he separates and again joins the two rings. The second single ring is now made to pass through in like manner, making the combination shown in figure 238. The performer remarks, We now have three joined together. Here are three more, as you see, shaking those in the left hand. All solid and separate, and yet at my will they will join like the others. Making a rubbing motion with the thumb as before, he drops two of the three, one by one, from the hand when they will appear as a chain of three. These he hands for examination, taking back the set of two and linking them, one after the other, into the key ring, to which now four rings are attached. Again, taking back the set of three, he links these also one by one into the key ring, which thus has seven rings inserted in it. See figure 239. Using both hands, but always keeping the opening of the key ring under one or the other thumb, he takes off these seven rings, commencing with the two single ones, and again offering them for examination, then taking off the set of two. Last of all, he unlinks the set of three, and then holding them at length in his left hand, joins the upper one to the key ring, thus making a chain of four, of which the key ring is the uppermost. He next takes the lowermost ring of the four, and links that into the key ring bringing the four rings into a diamond shape, as shown in figure 240. Again, unlinking the lower ring, he takes up the set of two, and connects them with the key ring, holding them up above it, thus making a chain of six, the key ring being third from the top, see figure 241. Taking the upper ring between his teeth, he links the two single rings into the key ring on either side making the figure of a cross as shown in figure 242. As the hands are now occupied in holding the single rings forming the arms of the cross, he can no longer keep the opening of the key ring concealed by the thumb, but it is extremely unlikely that among so many rings, so slight a mark in one of them will attract notice. Regaining possession of the key ring, he links all one by one into it, so again to bring them into the condition depicted in figure 239. Then, holding the key ring with both hands and with the opening downwards, about a couple of the feet from the floor, see figure 243, he shakes the ring violently, at the same time gently straining open the key ring. When the seven rings will all in succession drop through the slit and scatter themselves about the floor, the general impression being that they all fall separate, though the group sets of course remain still united. It is not an uncommon thing to see a performer commit the gauchery of handing all the rings and save only the key ring to be examined in the first instance, the key ring being hidden under the breast or under the tail of the coat, and being added to the set in returning to the table. The spectators are thus needlessly made acquainted with the fact that certain of the rings are already linked together, and this once admitted, the trick loses nine-tenths of its effect. The set of twelve rings is less frequently seen, and is rather more complicated to manage, though in good hands it is capable of much more brilliant effects than the smaller number. The set consists of five single rings, a group of two, a group of three, and two key rings. These are held in the hands of the performer in the following order. First, innermost, a key ring, then the group of three, then the second key ring, 
then the group of two, and lastly, the five single rings. The latter are distributed for examination. While they are still in the possession of the audience, the performer requests one of the spectators to link two of them together, and himself, taking in his right hand, the group of two, pretends to link the latter, as already described, and hands them for examination. The performer, meanwhile, takes in his right hand one of the key rings, and collects the single rings in his left hand. As soon as the group of two are handed back, he links one of them to the key ring in his right hand, thus forming a chain of three, with the key ring uppermost. Next, linking the lowest ring into the key ring, he forms figure 238, which, by holding the two lower rings apart, assumes the shape of a triangle. Again, disengaging the lower ring, passing one of the single rings from the left hand to the right, and laying down on the table all the rings remaining in that hand, the group of three uppermost. He joins the single ring to the key ring, thus making a chain of four, of which the key ring is second from the top. These he lays, still linked, upon the table, and takes up from the heap already lying there the three uppermost, which it will be remembered are the group of three, and holding them for a moment together in the hand, lets them fall one by one to form a second chain of three. Taking the next ring of the heap, the second key ring, in his disengaged hand, he steps forward and requests someone to take hold of either of the three rings and to pull against him in order to prove their solidity. This ascertained, he passes the upper ring of the three into the hand, which already holds the key ring, and links it into the key ring thus forming a second chain of four, of which in this case the key is the uppermost. Linking the lowermost into the key ring, he shows the ring as in figure 240. Once more unlinking the lower ring, so that the four again appear as a single chain. He proceeds, apparently, to link all twelve together. This is effected as follows. Taking two of the single rings, the performer links them into the key ring of the chain which he holds. He next links one of these same single rings into the key ring of the other chain, and thus linking the two chains together at a distance of one ring from the end of the chain. He thus has ten rings joined. He now takes the two chains, one in each hand, by the end remotest point from the junction, immediately after picking up and holding, one in each hand, the two remaining single rings. These, of course, he does not and cannot link with the rings adjoining them, but the audience, seeing that all the rest are linked together, readily believes that these also form part of the chain. The precise arrangement of the rings will be readily understood from an inspection of figure 244. The feet may either end here, the rings still linked, being gathered together and carried off by the assistant, or the performer may link all, one by one, into either of the key rings, and then shake them out and scatter them on the floor in the manner already described as to the eight rings. The performance may be elaborated to any extent, the two key rings giving a wonderful facility of combinations, but whatever be the passes adopted, they should not be too numerous, as the trick, however skillfully worked, consists only of the repetition of the same primary elements, and the interest of the spectators will quickly diminish. The performer should, in manipulating the rings, study neatness and lightness, rather than rapidity. The effect should be as though the rings melted into and out of one another, and the smallest appearance of force or exertion should be avoided. It has a very good effect in disengaging the rings one from another to hold them together for a moment or two after they are actually disconnected, and then holding them parallel to each other to draw them very slowly apart. The precise moment of their separation is thus left uncertain, the illusion being thereby materially heightened. A single ring may in this way be drawn along a chain of three or four the effect being as if the disengaged ring passed through the whole length of the chain. 
the charmed bullet. As a rule, people object to being shot at, and the least nervous person might fairly demur at facing the muzzle of a loaded pistol at six paces distance. But the magician is superior to such weakness, and will face a bullet with as little compunction as he would stop a ball at cricket. Neither must it be imagined that there is any deception at any rate in the quality of the articles employed. The pistol is a real pistol, the powder is genuine powder, and the bullet, an ordinary leaden bullet, is chosen and marked by one of the audience, fairly placed in the pistol, and fairly rammed home. The pistol is fired with deliberate aim by a disinterested spectator, but no sooner has the smoke cleared away than the performer is seen standing, unharmed, with the marked bullet caught between his teeth. So much for the effect of the trick. Now for the explanation. The pistol, see figure 245, is, as already stated, an ordinary weapon, and the only speciality of the bullets is that they are a size or two smaller than the bore of the pistol. The ramrod, B, is a plain cylinder of wood or metal, tapering very slightly at each end. The secret lies in the use of a little metal tube, A, about two inches in length, open at one end but closed at the other. This tube, which is of a size as to fit loosely within the barrel of the pistol, but tightly upon either end of the ramrod, is placed in the right-hand pochette of the performer and a small bag of bullets in the pochette on the other side. The performer comes forward with the pistol in one hand and the ramrod in the other, and having a small charge of gunpowder screwed up in a bit of soft paper, concealed between the second and third fingers of the right hand. He hands the pistol and the ramrod for inspection. While they are under examination, he asks, Can any lady or gentleman oblige me with a little gunpowder. Nobody answers, and he continues addressing some mild elderly gentleman. Perhaps you can accommodate me, sir. The elderly gentleman naturally replies that he is not in the habit of carrying gunpowder about with him. Excuse me, says the performer, but I fancy you have a small packet of powder under your coat collar. Permit me. And drawing his hand gently down beneath the collar, he produces the little packet. This he hands to the person who is holding the pistol, with the request that he will load it. While he puts in the powder, the performer drops his left hand to the pochette and palms the little bag of bullets, which he forthwith produces from a gentleman's hat or a lady's muff. From among the bullets, he requests that the person who put in the powder to select and mark one. While this is done, he himself takes the pistol in his left hand, holding it muzzle upwards, and in the act of transferring it with apparent carelessness to the other hand, secretly drops into it the little tube, the open end upwards. The spectator, having chosen and marked the bullet, is requested for greater certainty to place it in the pistol himself. A very minute portion of the paper is added by way of wad, and the performer then takes the pistol and rams it down. The bullet, of course, has fallen into the little tube, and as the ramrod fits tightly within the latter, it naturally, when withdrawn, brings out the tube and ball with it. The tube and ramrod are made to match, generally black but sometimes of brass or silver plated, and therefore the tube, when on the rod, even if exposed, would not be likely to attract attention. The performer, however, prevents the possibility of it doing so by holding the rod by the end, thereby concealing the tube within his hand. He now hands the pistol to a spectator, requesting him, for fear of accidents, to hold it muzzle upwards until the word to fire is given. The performer now takes up his position at the furthest part of the stage, and during his short journey gains possession of the bullet. This is effected by sharply drawing away the ramrod with the left hand, thereby leaving the tube open in the right and allowing the ball to roll out into the palm. The tube, having served its purpose, is gotten rid of into the porfode, and the ball is either slipped into the mouth 
or retained in the hand, according to the mode in which it is intended to be produced. Some performers use several small bullets. In our own opinion, a single ball of a tolerable size is not only more manageable, but more effective. The mode of producing the bullet also varies. Some, instead of producing it in the mouth, hold up a china plate by way of target, the bullet being held under the first two fingers against the front of the plate. When the pistol is fired, the plate is turned horizontally and the bullet released from the fingers. This plan is sometimes to be preferred, inasmuch as it creates an excuse for leaving the stage for a moment to fetch the plate, an opportunity which is valuable in the event, which sometimes happens, of the ball, from an excess of wadding, or any other cause, not dropping readily from the tube into the hand. To meet this possible difficulty, some tubes have, to use an Irishism, a small hole through the closed end, so that the performer, on leaving the stage, can, by pushing a piece of wire through the hole, instantly force out the bullet. End of section 43. Recording by Blazely Dragon. Section 44 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Modern Magic. A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Louis Hoffman. Section 44. Miscellaneous Tricks. Part 11. The Birth of Flowers. There are two or three different tricks which go by this name. Of one of them we may dispose in a very few words. It is purely a mechanical trick, having neither ingenuity of construction nor dexterity of manipulation to recommend it. The apparatus consists of a cover, A, C, figure 246, a base, C, and an intermediate portion, B, connected with A by means of a bayonet catch. C is beforehand partially filled with earth, and in B, the top of which is perforated with small holes, is inserted a natural or artificial plant or bouquet of flowers. The cover A is placed over B, and the apparatus is ready. The performer, drawing attention to C, pretends to sow some magic seed therein. He then places a cover over it, and pretending to warm it with his hands, commands the seeds to germinate. Releasing the bayonet catch, he removes the cover, and shows the flowers apparently just springing from the earth. In C. In some of the smaller sizes of this apparatus, the bayonet catch is dispensed with, the mere pressure of the fingers on the sides of A being sufficient to lift off B with it. The trick which we are about to describe, under the same title, is one of a composite nature, and one which, proceeding from marvel to marvel, produces in good hands a great effect. It is divided into three portions, first the production of a single flower, then of a handsome bouquet, and lastly of a large basket of flowers. The performer comes forward with his wand in one hand, and in the other a little box, in reality quite empty, but containing, as he asserts, magic seeds capable of producing, on an instant, the choicest flowers. I will first show you, ladies and gentlemen, their effect in the simplest form. In the hurry of coming here this evening, I omitted to provide a flower for my buttonhole, you will see how easily, by the aid of the magic seed, I can supply the deficiency. What shall it be? Clematis? Rose? Geranium? Suppose we say a rose. I take a single seed from my box. Ah, here is a rose seed. And place it in my buttonhole. He applies the supposed seed to the buttonhole. I breathe on it to supply the necessary warmth. I wave my wand. Once. Twice. Thrice. The seed has blossomed, you see, into a handsome rose. The explanation of this pretty little trick is exceedingly simple. The preliminary preparation is made as follows. Through the centre of an artificial rose, without stalk, 
a short piece about ten inches of thin black elastic is passed and secured by a knot on the inside of the flower the other end is passed through the buttonhole from the outside and thence through an eyelet hole made for the purpose in the breast of the coat immediately under the buttonhole the extreme end is looped over a button sewn on the waistcoat about the region of the waistband the tension of the elastic naturally draws the flower close against the buttonhole while yet allowing it when necessary to be drawn away from it to a distance of several inches the performer before coming forward to perform the trick draws the rose away from the buttonhole and places it under the left armpit whence so long as the arm is kept close to the side it cannot escape when he waves his wand with the words once twice thrice he makes the first motion facing to the right the second fronting the audience and the third facing slightly to the left at the same time striking the buttonhole with the wand and throwing up the left arm when the flower released instantly springs to the buttonhole the slight turn to the left completely covering the manner of its appearance but the trick is not yet over you see ladies and gentlemen that i am not dependent on covent garden for a rose for my buttonhole but you will naturally say ah the magic seed may be all very well for a single flower but what if you want a complete bouquet i hasten to show you that this is equally within my power will someone oblige me with the loan of a hat by way of hothouse thank you here you observe is an ordinary drinking glass this has meanwhile been placed on the table by the assistant in which i will drop haphazard a pinch of the magic seed this he does with the left hand the right being occupied with the hat and then with the glass in the left hand and the hat in the right comes forward to the audience requesting a lady spectator to breathe upon the glass which he immediately afterwards covers with the hat he now requests the same or another spectator to count ten to allow the mesmeric influence time to operate and then removing the hat shows a handsome bouquet natural or artificial in the glass returning the hat and handing the glass and flowers for inspection he borrows a silk pocket handkerchief or in default of procuring one from the audience uses one of his own brought forward by the assistant drawing it ropewise through his hands to show that it is empty he spreads it before him holding it by two of its corners having exhibited one side of it he spreads the other when the shape of something solid is seen to define itself beneath it and the handkerchief being removed a large round basket of flowers see figure 247 10 or more inches in diameter by two deep is revealed the reader with his present knowledge will probably have already conjectured the mode in which the bouquet is brought into the glass it is beforehand placed at the left hand corner of the servant the stem slanting upwards at the angle of about 45 degrees when the performer standing at the left hand side of the table drops the imaginary seed into the glass with his left hand his right holding the hat drops for a moment to the level of the table and clips between the second and third fingers the stem of the bouquet when by simply bending the fingers the bouquet is brought into the hat after the manner of the cannonball see page 305 when the hat is placed over the glass the bouquet is naturally brought into the latter we may here mention that there are bouquets of a special and rather ingenious construction enabling the performer in the act of producing the bouquet from a hat in the above or any similar trick to cause it suddenly to expand to three or four times its original size the bouquet is in this case made of artificial flowers stitched on a framework forming a kind of miniature parasol with a very short handle the bouquet when introduced into the hat has a slightly conical shape but the performer in withdrawing it puts up the parasol so to speak thereby spreading it to 12 or 14 inches diameter the production of the basket of flowers from the handkerchief is produced by wholly different means and will require a somewhat minute explanation 
in the first place the flowers are secured to the sides of the basket by silk or wires so that they cannot fall out in whatever position the basket is placed to the basket are attached two black silk threads the one which we will call a is about 18 inches in length and is attached to a button on the performer's waistband immediately above the front of his left thigh obviously therefore the basket if fastened by this thread alone would hang down loosely in front of the performer's left knee the second thread which we will call b and which is attached to the edge of the basket at a few inches distance from the first is only three or four inches in length and serves to suspend the basket behind the back of the performer concealed by his coat until the proper moment for its appearance for this purpose it has a small loop or ring at the loose end and this is attached by means of a strong short needle after the manner shown in figure 248 and 249 the latter representing a slightly enlarged view of the attachment to the waistband of the performer the needle carries a third thread c which passing through the cloth of the trousers is brought round and attached to the center button of the waistband being concealed by the edge of the waistcoat the modus operandi will now be easily understood the basket is in the first instance suspended by the thread b the performer while spreading the handkerchief before him ostensibly to show that it is empty crooks the little finger under the edge of his waistcoat and pulls c thereby withdrawing the needle and detaching b the basket being no longer held back by b falls but is compelled by a to swing round in front of the performer who while lifting it still covered by the handkerchief breaks a and thus altogether releases it the object of passing the needle through the cloth of the trousers is that it may not fall forward and be seen when c is pulled the contrivance last above described is the invention of robert houdia slightly simplified however inasmuch as he employed in place of the needle a little wire bolt working on a metal plate attached to the back of the waistcoat but the principle in either case is precisely the same the mysterious salver this is a tin tray see figure 250 ornamentally japanned and of about 12 inches in diameter there is a space of about three quarters of an inch between the upper and under surfaces of the tray at one side of which under cover of the curled rim is an opening of about three inches in width within this opening so placed as to be within easy reach of the fingers of any person holding the tray are two wire hooks marked a and b in the figure on gently pulling hook a a little hammer c rises up at right angles to the surface of the tray again falling back by the action of a spring as soon as the pull is relaxed on pulling b a similar movement is communicated to a sort of ladle d sunk in the surface of the tray and rising up in a direction parallel to that of the little hammer already mentioned this ladle has a flat tin cover hinged very loosely upon its outer edge so as to open of its own accord when the ladle passes the perpendicular position and japanned in such manner as to represent one of a circle of medallions forming part of the pattern of the tray and therefore little likely to attract attention if any small article be beforehand placed in the ladle and c be pulled the article will naturally be flung out upon the surface of the tray in practice however the salver is always used in conjunction with a little glass tumbler about three inches in height which being placed upon the medallion opposite to that which forms the cover of the ladle the contents of the latter fall into the glass instead of upon the tray the salver is generally used somewhat after the following fashion a little round brass box say an inch and a half in diameter and an inch deep is handed to the audience with a request that they will place any small article such as a coin a ring a watch key in it all necessary precautions are taken to prevent the performer knowing what the articles in question are and the box is for still greater security on this point 
wrapped by the performer in a handkerchief and handed to one of the audience to hold the reader with his present knowledge of the little faith that is to be put in the acts of magicians however apparently straightforward will readily conjecture that at this point there is a substitution the performer apparently wrapping up the box which has just been handed to him really substitutes another of similar appearance sewn in one corner of the handkerchief the latter which contains two or three metal buttons or other objects adapted to cause a rattling when shaken is so arranged that when the lid is pushed home a piece of cork within is pressed down upon the buttons and they are made silent but if the lid be raised ever so little and the box shaken they rattle this latter is the condition in which the box is wrapped in the handkerchief the performer leaving the dummy box wrapped up as above with the spectator retires for a moment in order to fetch the salver this gives him the opportunity to take the articles out of the box to note what they are we will suppose a ring a florin and a locket and place them in the ladle of the salver the empty box he places in one of his pockets he now brings forward the glass and salver together with a paper lampshade similar to those placed over the lights of a billiard table wherewith to cover the salver while the supposed flight of the objects takes place he first shows that there is nothing in his hands on the salver or in the glass and then places the latter in its proper position and covers the whole with the paper shade his assistant holds the salver using both hands with the right in such a position as to have control of the hooks a and b the performer requests the person holding the box to shake it in order to show that the articles are still there he then addresses the company to the following effect ladies and gentlemen allow me to remind you of the position of affairs some articles unknown to me have been placed by yourselves in a box that box has not been in my possession even for a moment but has remained ever since in the hands of the gentleman who is now holding it here as you see is a little glass he raises the shade with his left hand perfectly empty i shall now by virtue of my magic power order the articles in the box whatever they may be to leave the box and fall into this little glass and i will tell you by the sound of each as it falls what the article is let us try the experiment first article pass the assistant pulls a and the little hammer c forthwith strikes the glass simulating to some extent the sound of a small article falling therein that by the sound should be a coin i should say a florin hold tight sir please second article pass again the assistant causes the hammer to strike the glass that ladies and gentlemen is a ring you must hold tighter yet sir if you mean to defy my power third article pass this time the assistant pulls b causing the ladle d to rise and to shoot out the three articles together into the glass that i should say was a lady's locket fourth article pass this is a mere blind and elicits no response ladies and gentlemen there were three articles placed in the box a ring a florin and a locket and you will find that they have now all passed into the glass he removes the shade and shows that they have done so may i trouble you once more to shake the box the repeated injunctions to hold tighter have naturally caused the holder to press the lid home and the box is therefore silent corroborating the assertion that the articles have departed now ladies and gentlemen having conjured away the contents i shall now proceed to conjure away the box but this time by way of variety i will do it visibly attention he takes one corner of the handkerchief with his right hand now sir when i say three will you please drop the handkerchief one two three the performer shakes the handkerchief and pulls it rapidly through his hands till the corner containing the box comes into the left hand the box having apparently vanished 
the box has gone you see but where that is the question pardon me sir you have it in your pocket i think addressing some elderly gentleman of innocent aspect with the handkerchief still dangling from his left hand the performer thrusts the other hand into the waistcoat or breast pocket of the individual in question and produces from thence the missing box which he has a moment previously palmed from the pocket the weak point of this trick as above performed is the sound of the hammer on the glass which is but a poor imitation of that of coins or the like falling into it in some trays the hammer is altogether dispensed with the performer himself holding the tray and the necessary sound being produced by the assistant actually dropping a coin into a glass behind the scenes as near the standing place of the performer as possible this latter plan is much to be preferred a further improvement consists in the use in place of the salver of a small round table or gueridon made on the same principle without the hammer and worked by pulling a string from behind the scenes with a little dexterity the articles may be introduced into the ladle while in the act of placing the glass upon the table or of moving the latter to the front of the stage though it is more usual to do this behind the scenes and then to bring the table forward as described in the case of the salver the trick may be varied by borrowing four half crowns or florins duly marked which being exchanged and the substitutes placed in the half crown casket see page two hundred and two are thence made to pass one by one into the glass the vanishing die the effect of this trick in its simplest shape is merely to make a die some three inches square pass through the crown of a hat and be found inside the trick in this form is but a poor and transparent affair but it is sometimes useful as affording a pretext for borrowing a hat which you design to make use of for some other purpose and it furnishes the germ of two or three really effective illusions the apparatus consists of three portions a solid wooden die generally painted black with white spots a tin counterpart thereof fitting loosely over it and exactly similar in appearance but with one side open and an ornamental cover of thin pasteboard sometimes this is also of tin fitting in like manner over the hollow die the trick is worked very much after the manner of the cone recently described the performer comes forward having the solid die in one hand and the cover with the tin counterpart within it in the other placing these on the table he borrows two hats which he likewise places on the table mouth upwards ladies and gentlemen he commences i have here a block of wood he lets it fall on the floor the sound sufficiently indicating its solidity and again picks it up and a cover of simple pasteboard he places the cover over it as if merely suiting the action to the word and in again removing it leaves the tin die over the solid one if any one would like to examine it he is perfectly welcome to do so i have here also two hats borrowed haphazard from the audience and as you can all see perfectly empty and not prepared in any way now i propose to make this solid die he tosses it carelessly into one of the hats and again apparently takes it out but really takes out the hollow shell only pass right through the crown of one of these hats and fall into the other he places the hats one upon the other mouth to mouth and the tin shell with the opening downwards upon the uppermost here is the die which i cover thus now at my command it shall pass downwards through the hat one two three pass see the cover is empty taking it up with gentle pressure so as to lift the shell with it placing both on the end of his wand proving apparently that the cover is empty and here in the lower hat is the die let us try the experiment again i will replace the die in the lower hat one two three pass he lifts the cover without pressure leaving the hollow die on the upper hat it has obeyed you see once more one two three pass again the cover is empty 
and again the dye has passed into the lower hat. The dye dissolving in a pocket handkerchief. The trick last described has two drawbacks. First, that it is very generally known, and second, that the principle is rather too obvious, the secret being very easily guessed, even by persons not endowed with special sagacity. There is, however, an improved form of the same trick, at which an additional element is introduced, whereby these disadvantages are, to a great extent, removed. The apparatus used is the same as in the last case, with the addition of a coloured handkerchief prepared as follows. Five square pieces of stout pasteboard, each a shade larger than one side of the solid die, are joined together with hinges of tape or cloth, in the form shown by the dotted lines in figure 251. The centrepiece, A, is attached to the middle of the handkerchief, the others being allowed to hang loose upon their respective hinges. A second handkerchief of similar pattern is then laid upon the first, and the edges of the two are stitched together all round. The performer having exhibited the solid die and cover, as already explained, and having removed the latter with the hollow die within it, places it upon the table. Spreading the prepared handkerchief beside it, he places the solid die upon the centre of the handkerchief, and gathering up the four corners of the latter, lifts it, bag fashion, with his left hand the four loose flaps of pasteboard naturally folding themselves up around the die he now takes it with his right hand clipping the solid die within the pasteboard and turns the whole over as in figure 252 thus bringing the die uppermost with the folds of the handkerchief hanging down around it he next takes in the left hand a borrowed hat holding it up for a moment to show that it is empty then turning it mouth upwards he remarks i will place the die here in the hat suiting the action to the word he lowers his hand into the hat but as if suddenly bethinking himself he says no i won't use the hat at all perhaps someone will kindly hold the die and withdrawing his hand however he relaxes the pressure of his finger thereby leaving the solid die in the hat Though as the folded pasteboard retains its cubical shape, the handkerchief still appears to contain the die. Grasping it immediately below the folded shape, he gives the handkerchief in charge to one of the spectators, who is directed to hold it in like manner. The hat he places carelessly upon the table. He now once more lifts the corner with the hollow die, rattling his wand within it to show that it is empty again replacing it he commands the die to pass from the handkerchief under the cover the person holding the handkerchief is asked if he felt it depart but he naturally maintains that it is still in the handkerchief you are mistaken says the professor what you see is merely the ghost of the die still clinging to the handkerchief allow me and taking one corner he requests the owner to drop the handkerchief which he then shakes out exhibiting both sides to show that the die has vanished he then lifts the cover and shows the hollow die which the spectators take to be the genuine one and concludes the trick by finally commanding the die thus shown to pass into the hat which on being turned over is found to contain the solid die while the hollow die is again raised with the cover and the latter shown apparently empty the die and orange the die in this instance is about three and a half inches square. It has the usual ornamental tin or pasteboard cover, but there is an additional item of apparatus employed, a square wooden box with hinged lid and of such a size as to contain the die. The effect of the trick is as follows. The die is brought forward in the box, the performer holding the square cover in his other hand the die being then taken out of the box and placed on the table the box is shown empty and the cover placed over the die the performer having mysteriously procured an orange from the hair or whiskers of a spectator drops it into the box which is then closed he now asks the spectators in order to impress the facts on their memory where they suppose the two articles to be they naturally answer that they are where they have just seen them placed or 
if they venture to question this the performer raises the cover and opens the box and shows that die and orange both remain in statu quo he now commands the two articles to change places lifting the cover the die is found to have disappeared the orange having taken its place and on opening the box is seen to contain the die which is taken out and exhibited on all sides to the company the die and orange being again covered over at command change places as often as the company please the reader will doubtless have conjectured that there are in reality two dice and two oranges the box when first brought forward contains in reality two hollow dice one within the other the smaller and innermost the one which is afterwards taken out and placed under the cover is placed in the box with its open side towards the hinges and contains an orange the performer takes it out taking care of course that the orange does not fall out and places it open side downwards upon the table the cover is now placed over it and if lifted with pressure lifts the hollow die with it and reveals the orange but if lifted by the button on top so that the sides are not pressed it leaves the die covering the orange we now return to the box this contains a second hollow die so placed that the open side is upwards and the box therefore appears to be empty the lid however contains a sixth side exactly fitting the open space and thus making the die complete this movable side is alternately made to form a lining to the lid or to form part of the die according as a little button on the lid is moved in one or another direction both the true lid and this movable portion of it are lined with looking-glass so as to show no difference of appearance whether the box is exhibited empty or as containing the die when the sixth side is made to form part of the die the latter may be completely removed from the box and shown on all its sides without betraying the secret the orange for the time being remaining enclosed within it it is a good plan to have a solid die matching those used in the trick to be if necessary substituted and handed round for inspection if the performer uses a trap table it has a very good effect to conclude the trick by causing the orange under the cover to fall through the trap and then lifting the cover and hollow die together to show by rattling the wand within that both die and orange have altogether vanished end of section 44section 45 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor louis hoffman miscellaneous tricks part 12 the vanishing canary bird and cage this is another favorite die trick the performer exhibits a canary bird in a little oblong brass cage measuring six inches by four he next exhibits a die three inches square showing all sides to prove that it is solid this he places upon a tray which is held by the assistant and covers it with a fancy cover as already described he now throws a handkerchief over the cage bringing it forward thus covered to the company he orders the cage to vanish the die to pass into a borrowed hat and the bird to appear upon the tray in place of the die no sooner said than done he waves the handkerchief which is seen to be empty and on raising the cover the bird is found under it while on turning over the hat out falls the die the disappearance of the cage which is of the form shown in figure two hundred fifty three will be readily understood by any reader who has followed the description of the flying glass of water described at page three hundred sixty seven the handkerchief used is double and contains in its centre stitched between the two surfaces an oblong wire frame in size and shape exactly corresponding with the top of the cage when the performer throws the handkerchief over the cage on the table 
he takes care to bring this wire shape immediately over the cage. When he apparently lifts the cage under the handkerchief, which he does standing behind his table, he really lifts the handkerchief only, distended by the hidden wire, and with the other hand he gently lowers the cage out of sight upon the servante. So much for the disappearance of the cage, but it yet remains to be explained how the bird comes to be found under the cover in place of the die. This is effected as follows. There are two dice, the one solid, the other of hollow tin, and having one side wanting, but capable of being closed at pleasure by means of a sliding lid also of tin, which supplies the missing side and is painted accordingly. The outer edge of this lid is folded over outwards in a semicircular form. See figure 254. The tray used, see figure 255, is of tin, japanned, and of ordinary appearance, but has a square piece of tin of the same size as one of the sides of the die, soldered upon its center at about one-sixteenth of an inch above the surface. Three of its sides are soldered to the tray, the fourth being left open. The center of the tray is ornamentally japanned, in such a manner as to conceal the special arrangement. A duplicate bird is beforehand placed in the hollow die, which is then closed and placed either upon the servante, or in one of the secret pockets of the performer, who, having borrowed a hat, secretly slips the hollow die into it, and places it on the table, mouth upwards. He now brings forward and offers for inspection the solid die, the cover, and the birdcage, placing the latter when returned upon his table, rather towards the hinder edge. The die, he carelessly remarks, I will place in this hat, suiting the action to the word, or better still, I will place it upon this tray, so that you may be able to keep sight of it throughout the trick. So saying, he again takes out apparently the same, but really the hollow die, and places it on the tray with the movable side downwards, in such manner as to hook the turned-over portion of that side into the open edge of the corresponding square upon the tray, and places the cover over it. Handing the tray to his assistant, he proceeds to cause the disappearance of the birdcage from the handkerchief, as already described. This done, he advances to the tray and lifts the cover with the hollow die within it, first, however, sliding away cover and die together towards the opposite end of the tray, see figure 256, and thereby leaving behind upon the center of the tray the movable slide, the interior of which is japanned so as to correspond with the center pattern of the tray, and thus not attract any attention. The solid die, having remained in the hat, may readily be produced when required. THE DECANTER AND THE CRYSTAL BALLS The routine of this trick, as practiced by different performers, varies a good deal. We propose to describe it in two forms, the first being as nearly as possible that which was adopted by Robert Houdin. First Method The apparatus in this case consists of four glass balls, two of plain glass an inch and a half in diameter, one of ruby-colored glass of the same size, and one of plain glass three-quarters of an inch in diameter, and a decanter of clear glass with a hollow or kick underneath it, just large enough to admit one of the larger balls. The decanter is two-thirds filled with port or claret, and is brought forward with the red ball beneath it, in the hollow we have mentioned, and is placed on the performer's table. The remaining balls are disposed as follows. The two large balls in the performer's left pochette and the small one in the pochette on the other side. Thus provided, the performer comes forward, wand in hand. Taking the wand carelessly in his right hand, he says, Ladies and gentlemen, I have already given you some proofs of the singular powers of this wand, but I do not know whether I have drawn your attention to one remarkable faculty which it possesses, that is, that if I strike anything with it, at the same time mentally calling for any object, that object is instantly produced from the article touched. Let us put it to the test. He pulls back his coat sleeves, showing indirectly, by a careless gesture, that his hands are empty. For the purpose of the trick I am about to show you, I require a crystal ball. Now observe, I give but one gentle touch, not here upon the table, he wraps the table with his wand, 
where you might suspect some mechanism or preparation, but here in my empty hand, and instantly you see a ball appears at my bidding. As he touches the table with the wand, thereby drawing the eyes of the spectators in that direction, he carelessly drops his left hand to his side and takes from the pochette and palms one of the plain glass balls, which as soon as the wand reaches his hand he produces at the fingertips. The ball, as you see, ladies and gentlemen, is of solid crystal, without crack or flaw. He takes it in the right hand, tosses it up, and catches it again. The hardest steel would fail to chip it, and yet, by my magic power, I am able instantly to divide it into two equal portions, each round and true as the original. At the moment of tossing the ball in the air, all eyes are naturally attracted to it, and the performer has ample opportunity to again drop the left hand to his side and palm the second ball. Keeping this in the palm of the left hand, he transfers the first ball to the fingertips of the same hand. Drawing the wand across it, he allows it to drop into the palm and to strike against the ball already there. Rubbing his palms together, as if to mold the divided ball into shape, he shows the two balls, professedly the divided portions of the first. Taking one in each hand, he continues, I undertook to make the divided portions exactly equal, but I have not succeeded so well as usual. It seems to me that this one is rather the larger. What say you, ladies and gentlemen? He places the two balls on the table, side by side, as if for comparison, and carelessly dropping the right hand to his side, palms between the second and third fingers, see page 273, the small ball. Yes, this one is certainly the larger, but I can easily rectify the mistake by pinching a little piece off. Taking the ball in the left hand, he pretends to pinch off a portion from it with the right, at the same time letting the little ball fall to the fingertips of the latter. He replaces the large ball on the table, rolling the little ball between the fingers, as though to give it roundness. No, that one is still the biggest. I haven't taken quite enough yet. I must take a little more. Or better still, I will add this little piece to the smaller one. Taking the supposed smaller ball in his left hand, he pretends to squeeze the little one into it, presently letting the latter fall behind it into the palm of the left hand, and replacing the two larger balls side by side on the table dropping the little ball at the first opportunity into the pochette. He continues, I think they are now about right. The reason why I have been so particular about it is that I am about to pass one of these balls into the other, which I could not have done unless they had been of exactly the same size. Now which of them shall I pass into the other? It is for you to decide. He has meanwhile moved so as to be behind his table, standing sideways, with his right side to the table. Whichever ball the company decides is to be passed into the other, he takes in his right hand, immediately afterwards taking the other in his left hand, which he holds aloft, following it with his eyes. Stretching back the right arm, as though to give an impetus to the ball, he drops it into a padded box or basket, placed upon the servante to receive it, immediately afterwards bringing the right hand with a semicircular sweep upon the left, and rolling the ball the latter contains between the palms, as though to press the one ball into the other, and presently showing that the hands now contain one ball only. The same effect may be produced without the aid of the table, as follows. Taking both the balls in his right hand, as in figure 257, the performer covers them with the left hand, retaining as he does so ball A with the thumb, but allowing ball B to roll down the left sleeve, which, with a little practice, will be found by no means difficult. He now rubs the palms together, as if rubbing the one ball into the other, and then separating them shows that the two balls have become transformed into one only. This he exhibits in the right hand, and while the eyes of the company are attracted to the ball, lowers the left arm, allowing the ball to run down the sleeve into the hand, whence it is immediately dropped into the pochette on that side. The next step is the supposed coloring of the ball. The performer continues, Ladies and gentlemen, having proved to you my perfect control over the ball in respect of size, I propose to show you that I have equal mastery over it in respect of color. 
this i shall do by passing it into this bottle of wine which being red the ball will become red also had the bottle contained a blue liquid you would have found the ball become blue and so on the ball he takes it in his left hand and apparently transfers it to his right by the tourniquet keeping the right hand closed as if containing it and dropping it from the left into the pochette on that side is considerably larger than the neck of the bottle this in a natural way would be rather a difficulty but to a magician it will give very little trouble i have only to squeeze the ball a little he lifts the bottle with the left hand at the same time slipping the little finger underneath it to prevent the red ball beneath it falling and holding the right hand an inch or two above it works the hand as if compressing the ball and it gradually becomes smaller and smaller until it melts completely into the bottle he opens the right hand and shows it empty immediately afterwards shaking the bottle and allowing the ball beneath to rattle slightly the ball is now in the bottle as you see the next step is to get it out and it is rather difficult to do this without at the same time allowing the wine to escape however we will try i have no doubt that by strong effort of will i shall be able to manage it he now takes the bottle between his hands holding it so that the two little fingers are beneath and after a little shaking allows the ball to drop as if through the bottle this may be varied by holding the bottle with the left hand only and striking the mouth with the palm of the other allowing the ball to drop at the third stroke professedly expelled by the compression of the air second method the balls used in this instance are five in number two large one of each color two small one of each color and one a trifle larger than these latter of which one half is red and one half white the decanter is replaced by an ordinary wine bottle see figure 258 prepared as follows a tin tube a three inches in length closed at the bottom but open at the top is made to fit within the neck just so tightly that it cannot fall out of its own accord its upper edge being turned over all round and japanned black so that when placed in the bottle it may be indistinguishable from the actual neck the cavity at the bottom of the bottle is filled with a resinous cement in such manner as only to leave room for one of the larger balls the tube is beforehand filled with port or claret and placed in the neck the bottle itself which if not naturally opaque must be rendered so by an interior coating of black japan should be nearly filled with water thus prepared it is brought forward and placed on the table the balls are disposed as follows the two white ones in the left pochette of the performer the two red ones and the party-colored ball in the pochette on the other side coming forward to the audience the performer produces the large white ball either as described in the first form of the trick or from his wand in manner described at page two hundred seventy six while showing it in his left hand he drops the right hand to his side and palms the large red ball laying the white ball on the table he remarks i have here a bottle of wine we will begin by testing its genuineness he lifts the bottle by the neck with the left hand immediately transferring it to the right which grasps it around the bottom and introduces beneath it the red ball which is thenceforth kept in position by the little finger taking in the other hand a wine glass which should be of such a size as just to contain the contents of the tube he fills it with wine and hands it to one of the company in returning to his table he secretly withdraws the tube this is easily done by grasping the bottle round the neck with the left hand and gently drawing it downwards with the right the turned over portion of the tube being clipped by the finger and thumb of the left hand in which it naturally remains as the performer passes behind the table he gets rid of the tube by dropping it on the servante in placing the bottle on the table he is of course careful not to expose the red ball underneath it taking the white ball in his left hand he proposes to turn it red and for that purpose to pass it into the bottle pretending to transfer it to the right hand by the tourniquet he drops it from the left hand into the padded tray on the servante and then apparently passes it into the bottle as above the routine of getting it out of the bottle again 
is the same as above described in relation to the first method we may however here note a variation in practice some performers instead of introducing the red ball under the bottle at the outset of the trick as above described make no attempt to bring it under the bottle until after the white ball is supposed to have been passed into the wine when the performer raising the bottle with the left hand transfers it to the right and brings the ball under it retaining it there with the little finger until he thinks fit to allow it to drop pretending to squeeze the bottom of the bottle as if to force it out after having produced the red ball the performer remarks Perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, you imagine that I have not really passed the ball through the bottle, and that the effect is, in reality, produced by the substitution of a different colored ball. Let me assure you that so truly is the wine in the bottle, and nothing else, the cause of the change of color, that you will find on examination that every particle of color has left the wine, its whole virtue having been absorbed by the ball." supposing for a moment that i could have exchanged the ball you will hardly imagine that i could exchange the liquid in the bottle which has been proved to be good old wine will the same gentleman who tried it before be good enough to taste it now taking another glass he fills it from the bottle which is now found to contain nothing but water the performer meanwhile has again palmed the white ball which he next produces as being a new one from his wand comparing the red and the white together he pretends to discover that the red is the largest and therefore pinches from it a small portion the small red ball he now discovers that he has taken too much and that the red ball is now the smaller he therefore pinches a second piece the small white ball from the white one and finally rolls the two little balls thus obtained into one producing the party-colored ball the mode of producing these last effects will present no difficulty to any one who has attentively studied the description of the first form of the trick the flags of all nations this is in good hands a very pretty and effective trick but requires considerable neatness of manipulation its effect is as follows the performer comes forward with a couple of miniature silk flags measuring say three inches by two taking one in each hand he brings the hands together and begins to wave them backwards and forwards when the flags are seen to multiply the two being suddenly transformed into a dozen quickly increasing to a still larger number not only do the flags increase in number but in size also until perhaps a couple of hundred have been produced ranging in dimensions from one or two inches square to a foot or even larger and of six or eight different colors this seeming marvel rests on a very slight foundation. The flags to be produced are of colored tissue paper, with flagstaffs made of wire, or of the bass of which scrubbing brooms are made, so as to occupy very little space. These are rolled up together in little parcels, like with like according to size. Thus arranged, they are placed, the smaller ones in the sleeve of the performer, and the larger ones about his person, with the ends just inside the breast of his waistcoat while waving the first two flags backwards and forwards he gets one of the parcels from the sleeve into his hands immediately unrolling and developing it when the two flags appear to have multiplied into fifty under cover of these he draws down from the sleeve another parcel which he develops in like manner and after the sleeves are exhausted has recourse to the fresh store within the waistcoat he all along takes care to retain in his hands a large and widespread bundle of the flags, which, being kept moving backwards and forwards, materially aids in covering the mode of production of the remainder. The Umbrella Trick The performer comes forward with an umbrella, which may be either the commonplace article of everyday life, or a brilliant fancy production akin to Joseph's coat of many colors. This he hands for inspection, and meanwhile borrows a lady's handkerchief. The latter, for safe keeping, he places in an empty vase, which is left in full view of the company. The umbrella, duly examined, he places in a case, which may be either the ordinary glazed oilskin case, or a special apparatus prepared for the purpose. Whichever it be, the result is the same. 
on again uncovering the vase the handkerchief has vanished and in its place is found the silk covering of the umbrella on removing the umbrella from its case it is found to have lost its covering but the handkerchief torn in several pieces is found fastened to its naked ribs one piece to each these are removed again the vase is covered and the umbrella restored to the case the torn fragments of the handkerchief are burnt and their ashes invisibly passed into the vase and on a new examination the two articles are found uninjured as at first with reference to the transformation of the handkerchief in the vase it will be only necessary to state that the vase employed is either the burning globe see page two hundred forty six or the pea vase described at page three hundred fifty one in either case a duplicate umbrella cover is placed in the second compartment and thus the vase may be shown to contain either the handkerchief or the umbrella cover at pleasure with regard to the umbrella the reader will readily conjecture that an exchange is effected but the mode of effecting it varies if the ordinary glazed case is used the umbrella is exchanged bodily for another similarly encased placed beforehand on the servante this however requires some little dexterity as an umbrella from its length is an awkward article to exchange and this has led to the employment of cases specially constructed to effect the change the most frequently used is an upright pillar of zinc or tin oval in form and open at the top and so constructed as to stand upright without support see figure two hundred fifty nine it is divided vertically into two compartments in one of which is placed beforehand the second umbrella of course no one can be permitted to examine or even look into the case which is a serious drawback to the effect of the trick there is however another form of case sometimes employed which is a trifle less objectionable this is a wooden tube about three feet long and three and a half inches square see figure two hundred sixty like the case already described it is closed at the bottom and open at the top and divided vertically into two compartments a and b one or other of these however is always closed by the flap c which by virtue of a spring is normally compelled to take the position shown in the figure thus closing compartment b when required for use the second umbrella is placed in compartment a and the flap c drawn back as shown by the dotted line so as to close a in which position it is held by a little catch the performer hands the genuine umbrella for inspection to one of the spectators with a request that he will himself place it in the case as soon as he has done so the performer by a movement of his forefinger draws back the catch and releases c which flying back to the opposite position shuts in the genuine umbrella and reveals the substitute when this apparatus is employed the supposed restoration of the umbrella is omitted some performers dispense with the use of the vase and vanish and reproduce the borrowed handkerchief by sleight of hand after one or other of the modes described in relation to handkerchief tricks the passe passe trick the trick which is specially designated by this name which would appear to be equally applicable to about three parts of the tricks we have described is as follows the performer brings forward a bottle and a small tumbler which he places side by side upon the table producing a couple of tin or pasteboard covers ornamentally japanned of a size to just go over the bottle he places one of them over the bottle and another over the glass he now commands the two articles to change places and on again removing the covers the glass and bottle are found to be transposed again he covers them and again the change takes place and this he repeats as often as he pleases occasionally pouring out wine or other liquor to show that the bottle is a genuine one and not a mere make-believe the reader will already have anticipated that there are in reality two bottles and two glasses the bottles are of tin japanned to resemble the ordinary black bottle but with the bottom only about a couple of inches below the neck leaving an open place beneath for the reception of the glass each bottle has near the bottom at the side which is kept away from the audience an oval opening or finger hole measuring about an inch and a half by one inch 
when it is desired to lift the glass with the bottle, the middle finger is made to press on the glass through this opening, thereby lifting both together with perfect safety. The outer cover just fits easily over the bottles, and if lifted lightly, leaves the bottle on the table, but if grasped with some little pressure, carries the bottle with it. The mode of working the trick will now be readily understood. The bottle which is brought forward has a second glass concealed within it, kept in position while the bottle is brought in by the pressure of the finger. The cover which is placed over this bottle is empty. The other cover, which is placed over the glass, contains the second bottle, which, being hollow below, enables the performer to rattle his wand within it, and thus, apparently, to prove the cover empty. Having covered the glass and bottle, he raises the cover of the first very lightly, leaving the glass concealed by the second bottle, but lifts the other with pressure, so carrying the bottle with it, and revealing the glass which has hitherto been concealed within it. By reversing the process, the bottle and glass are again made to appear, each under its original cover. Where it is desired to pour wine from either bottle, the performer takes care in lifting it to press the glass through the finger hole, and thus lifts both together. For obvious reasons, the glass into which the wine is poured should be a third glass, and not either of the two which play the principal part of the trick. End of section 45section 46 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor lewis hoffman stage tricks part 1 the present chapter will be devoted to such tricks as by reason of the cumbrousness or costliness of the apparatus required for them are as a rule exhibited only upon the public stage the stage performer may if he pleases avail himself of the aid of mechanical tables electrical appliances etc which enable him to execute a class of tricks which are beyond the scope of an ordinary drawing-room performance though the wealthy amateur will find no difficulty in converting his own drawing-room into a quasi-stage and qualifying it for the presentation of the most elaborate illusions the leading items of apparatus in stage magic are mechanical tables these are of various kinds many being specially designed to assist in the performance of some one particular trick putting aside these which will be separately noticed stage tables may be broadly divided into three classes trap tables piston tables and electrical tables in practice these classes are somewhat intermingled for it is rather the rule than the exception for a stage table to be fitted with both traps and pistons while either or both of these may be found in conjunction with electrical appliances trap tables are such as provided with one or more traps their object being at the will of the operator to cause the disappearance of a given article into the interior of the table or sometimes to produce or apparently change an article the traps most generally used may be described as follows one the plain trap this consists of a thin plate of metal generally zinc screwed down flush with the top of the table in this which we will call the surface plate is cut a hole generally circular and from two to four inches in diameter closed by a flap or door which by the action of a spring hinge is pressed up level with the rest of the trap though it instantly yields to pressure from above again rising as soon as such pressure is removed figures 261 and 262 represent the trap as seen detached from the table figure 261 exhibiting its underside a is the circular flap b b the spring hinge c a little bolt by means of which the trap may be fastened at pleasure and which is worked by a pin projecting upwards through a slot in the surface plate and through the cloth which covers the table d is a small flat piece of metal screwed to the underside of the flap a and acting as a stop to prevent the flap from being forced by the action of the spring above the level of the surface plate the mountings of the trap are generally brass and attached to the zinc by screws. A brass eyelet, E, is sometimes soldered to the center of the underside of the flap. 
To this is attached a cord, which may hang down ready to the performer's hand at the back of the table, or may be carried down a groove in one of the hinder legs, and either terminate in a pedal, to be pressed by the foot of the performer, or to be continued behind the scenes within reach of the hand of the assistant. The mode of working the trap is as follows. Any small article being placed on it is covered over, either with an ornamental cover or with a simple handkerchief. The cord being gently pulled by either of the means above mentioned, the trap opens, and the article falls into the body of the table. As soon as the pull is relaxed, the flap again rises and closes the opening. Where a cord is not used, the performer gets rid of the article by direct pressure on the trap or the article upon it with the one hand, while with the other he veils the opening in the table. 2. The wrist or pressure trap. With this form of trap, the use of a cord is unnecessary, the trap being worked from the surface of the table by pressure upon a particular spot. The manner of its construction will become clear upon an inspection of figures 263 and 264. Figure 263 represents the underside of the trap. A is the flap, working upon a spring hinge, B. B, as already explained in the case of the plane trap, C. C is an oblong piece of metal cut out of and lying flush with the surface plate and working upon an ordinary hinge at D. When C is pressed down, the cross piece E, which is soldered to it, presses down the lever F, and this in turn acting upon the shorter lever G, which is fixed at right angles to the rod upon which the flap A is hinged, causes the latter to open. The mode of using the wrist trap is as follows. The performer has occasion, we will suppose, to cause the disappearance of an orange, for instance, in the bran and orange trick, described at page 335. Placing the orange upon the flap, A, he places both hands round it as though to pick it up between them. In this position, the underhand of the hand furthest from the audience, see figure 266 showing the right hand removed, is just over C, and pressing gently upon it causes the flap to open and the orange to fall through the position of the hands completely veiling the operation. The operator now leaves the table, still holding his hands as though having the orange between them, and after a due interval brings them closer and closer together, at last showing that it has vanished. The wrist trap is generally worked by the performer standing at the side of the table, and the traps are therefore made to be right-handed and left-handed according to the end at which they are intended to be placed the rule being that c must be so placed with reference to a as to be when in use under the hand furthest from the spectators figure two sixty seven illustrates the difference of make to suit the one or the other end of the table three the rabbit or dove trap this as its name indicates is a trap for causing the disappearance of a rabbit or pigeon the opening is in this case oval measuring about eight inches by six and closed by a double flap divided down the middle see figure 268 representing the underside of the trap it has no string the animal being simply pushed down through the trap under cover either of a second rabbit or of a piece of paper in which the victim is supposed to be wrapped as the rabbit trap requires considerable space and moreover involves the necessity of some sort of an enclosure within the table to prevent an unexpected reappearance of the animal it is a convenient plan to devote to it a small special table this should be circular about 32 inches in height and 16 to 18 in diameter the upper part of the table must form a circular wooden box about eight inches in depth with an opening behind to get out the rabbit the table may, like the principal table, have a servante behind it, which will greatly increase its utility. The depth of the upper part may be concealed by a hanging fringe, the general appearance of the table, seen from the back, being as shown in figure 269. A table of this class makes a pretty side table, and may be balanced on the opposite side of the stage by another of similar appearance, but designed for some different purpose. The interior of the table should be well padded with wadding or hay so that the animal may not be hurt by its sudden descent. Each of the traps above mentioned should be so made as to be capable of being secured when necessary by a bolt, or there would be considerable risk of a trap giving way unexpectedly under any article carelessly placed on it. The mode of bolting, however, varies considerably. 
Some traps are fastened by little bolts on the underside, which, being only get atable from the inside of the table, must be bolted or unbolted for good before the curtain rises, occasioning considerable embarrassment in the case of a slip of the memory. Others, again, are secured by means of long bolts or wire rods extending across under the surface of the top of the table, each terminating in a hook at the back within the reach of the performer's hand. A third, and we think the best plan, is to have the bolts, as shown in figures 261 and 262, and therein marked C, worked backwards and forwards by means of a little pin projecting upwards through the surface plate and the cloth of the table. By the adoption of this plan, the performer is enabled to draw back the bolt with the fingertip in the very act of placing the article upon the trap. It will readily suggest itself to the reader that some provision must be made within the table for making the various articles drop noiselessly through the traps. The best plan of effecting this is to use what is called a railway. This is a wooden frame just large enough to lie within the table with a piece of black serge or alpaca stretched all over its underside. This is so placed within the table as to slope gently down to the level of the servante with a fall of three or four inches. Any article dropped through a trap will not only fall noiselessly upon the surface of the stretched alpaca, but will immediately roll down the incline towards the servante, so that it is instantly get addable, should the performer have occasion to reproduce the same article at a later stage of the trick. 4. Changing Traps The traps which we have hitherto discussed have only had the faculty of causing the disappearance of a given article. Those which we are about to describe will not only do this, but will moreover produce an article on the surface of the table where a moment previously there was nothing, or will replace a given object by another. The trap for this purpose is a somewhat complicated arrangement of the appearance shown in figures 270 and 271. The surface plate AAAA is oblong, measuring about 12 inches by 6 with a circular opening BB in the center. Below it are fixed vertically two brass cylinders, C and D, which are so arranged as to work backward and forward on a kind of railway, EF, EF, in the direction of the length of the surface plate, just so far in either direction as to bring C or D in turn immediately under B. The two cylinders are soldered together so that one cannot move without the other. If, therefore, the cylinders are drawn back to the utmost by means of one of the bent iron rods, or handles, GH, the cylinder C will be below the opening B, as in figure 272. If, on the contrary, they be pushed forward, D will in turn be below the opening, as in figure 273. Each cylinder contains a brass piston, faced with zinc on its upper surface and moved up and down by a lever attached at right angles to one or other of the iron handles GH already mentioned, and working through a vertical slot in the side of the cylinder. A piece of clock spring, attached to the iron handle at the point of junction, gives the piston a gentle upward tendency, which is so regulated that if either of the cylinders be brought under the opening B, the piston belonging to that cylinder is made to rise into the opening, its upper surface resting just flush with that of AAAA. The piston of the forward cylinder C is made to work very easily within it, so as to rise spontaneously by the action of the spring but that of the hinder cylinder d for a reason which will presently appear works a little more stiffly so as to require a little assistance from the lever to make it rise into its proper position the action of the handles g h is outwards in the direction of the arrows in figure 274 the movement of either handle in the direction so indicated drawing down the piston to which it belongs the handles further serve, as already mentioned, to move the cylinders backwards and forwards as may be required. It should, however, be noted that no backward or forward movement can take place so long as either of the pistons stops the opening B, but as soon as the piston is, by turning the proper handle, depressed ever so little below the level of the surface plate, it no longer forms any obstacle to the movement. The trap is fixed in the table in such manner that the handles GH shall be just within the opening at the back of the table c figure 274 and thus be within easy reach of the performer's hands when standing behind it we will suppose for the sake of illustration that the performer desires to change an empty tumbler of small size to a full one the trap is beforehand prepared by bringing the foremost cylinder c under the opening b the full glass is then placed on the top of the piston which is then lowered gently downwards by means of the proper handle 
the glass sinking into the cylinder. The cylinders are now pushed forward, so that D in turn comes under B, the piston being then moved up into its proper place and so closing the opening. This is, of course, arranged before the curtain rises. When the performer desires to perform the trick, he places the empty glass upon B and conceals it with a cover of any kind. Standing carelessly behind the table, and keeping the attention of the audience occupied by any observations he may deem most appropriate for that purpose, he takes hold with his right hand of the handle H and turns it outward, thereby lowering the empty glass in to D. As soon as he feels that it will sink no further, he shifts his hand to handle A and therewith draws the cylinders back so as to bring C under B and then, by turning G, gently raises the full glass of water up through B to the surface of the table. The reader will now perceive the reason why, as already mentioned, the piston in D is made a little tight so as to require the assistance of the handle to raise it into its position. It is necessary that this piston, when once depressed with the object to be changed, shall remain down while the hand is shifted from handle H to handle G. If it were not made to work somewhat stiffly, the moment the handle H was released, the piston would instantly fly up again with the object upon it, thus neutralizing what had been already done. The cylinder C, which is to produce the substitute object, is not brought under B until the hand of the performer is already on the handle belonging to it, and can thereby check its upward ascent as may be necessary. It is obvious that the changing trap will be equally available to produce an object under an empty cover. The object to be produced will be placed in C as above, the piston in D going down empty, and that in C rising with the object upon it. The above are the traps in most frequent use, but there are others designed for special purposes. Thus, there is a trap for causing the disappearance of six or eight half-crowns, as, for instance, in the well-known trick of the crystal cash-box, which will be described in the course of the present chapter. Of course, the coins could be made to disappear through an ordinary trap, but they would cause a suggestive chink in their fall. The trap to which we are now referring is designed to prevent this tell-tale sound and to cause the half-crowns to disappear in perfect silence. The opening in the surface plate is an inch and three-quarters in diameter and is closed by a circular piston of brass or zinc, A, working up and down in a small brass cylinder, B, and so arranged as to drop by its own weight to the bottom of the cylinder, save when kept up by a little lever catch at the side of the cylinder. A short pin, D, attached to this catch, projects upwards through a slot in the surface plate and stands up very slightly above the cloth of the table. The disc, A, being raised level with the surface plate and secured by means of the catch, six or eight half-crowns or florins are placed upon A. The performer, in making the motion of picking up the coins with one hand, with the tip of the third finger pulls the pin, D, towards him. This withdraws the catch and A instantly drops down the bottom of the cylinder, carrying the coins with it. As soon as A reaches its lowest point, it draws down the pin E, thereby releasing a similar disc F, which, working laterally on a spring pivot at the edge of the opening, describes a semicircle and assumes a position previously occupied by A, a portion of one side of the cylinder at the top being cut away to allow of its passage. Figure 275 shows the trap in its first, and figure 276 in its second condition, the latter being, for greater clearness, drawn in section. The apparatus is rather complicated, and it is almost helpless to endeavor to render it clearly intelligible by description only. In the absence of this special trap, the same object may be nearly as well affected with an ordinary trap by using half-crowns. Be it remembered that it is always substitute coins which are made to disappear in this manner, which have been beeswaxed on both sides. A very slight pressure will cause a number of coins thus prepared to adhere together and form for the time being a solid mass, which will fall through the trap without causing any clink. We next come to pistons. These are appliances for working pieces of mechanical apparatus, as, for example, the watch target, the card star, the demon's head, etc., etc. A piston consists of a brass tube, A, about five inches in length by five-eighths of an inch in diameter, with a collar at one end pierced with screw holes for affixing it to the under surface of the table. Within this tube works a wire rod, B, three-sixteenths of an inch thick, and terminating in a small round disc of brass, C, 
just large enough to work freely up and down the tube a spiral spring also of brass keeps the rod down unless when forced upwards by pulling a piece of whip cord which is attached to the disc c and thence passes up the tube and over a small pulley d which is soldered to the collar already mentioned when this cord is pulled b is forced to rise which it does to the extent of about two inches above the surface of the table again sinking under the pressure of the spring as soon as the pull is relaxed each piston is screwed to the under surface of the top of the table in which a small hole is bored in order to allow of the upward passage of the piston rod where complicated mechanical pieces have to be worked three four or more of these pistons are placed side by side the cords are carried behind the scenes either directly from the back of the table or down grooves in the legs and through holes in the stage to the hiding place of the assistant where a single piston only is required it may be made to work in the central pillar of a light gyridon or fancy table such as shown in figure 279 the lightness and simplicity of the table and the thinness of its top apparently precluding all possibility of the presence of concealed mechanism the cord may be made to pass down the center pillar so as to be quite invisible to the audience the mechanical pieces worked by the agency of these pistons vary greatly in construction but they are alike in one particular viz that they are set in motion by one or more vertical rods passing up the shaft or column on which they stand and each terminating in a flat metal disc or pedal which receives the upward pressure of the piston figure 280 shows the arrangement of the foot of a mechanical piece worked by one such rod only another specimen will have been observed in the case of the pedestal for the animated money see page 186 where three or four petals are necessary they are generally enclosed in a square wooden base as in the case of the demon's head described at page 458 end of section 46section 47 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor lewis hoffman stage tricks part 2 before quitting the subject of the tables used upon the stage we must not omit to say a few words as to what is called the bellows table though it is now comparatively little used it was formerly say forty or fifty years ago the fashion among conjurers to use tables with drapery hanging to within a few inches of the floor the table being say two feet seven inches high this gave room for a box-like arrangement of two feet deep or thereabouts within the body of the table in this box which was open at the back was hidden an assistant who worked the pistons managed the traps effected necessary substitutions etc etc conjuring under such circumstances was very easy work in 1845 however Robert Houdin gave his first public performance and one of the earliest of his reforms in the magic art was the suppression of the too suggestive drapery and the substitution of tables of light and elegant form allowing no possible room for the concealment of an assistant a reaction set in favor of the new fashion which has ever since maintained the ground the bellows table combines the apparent simplicity of the undraped table with the internal capacity of the old-fashioned draped article there is a trick formerly very popular as the wind-up of an entertainment which consists of the magical disappearance of a youthful assistant male or female the subject of the trick generally dressed in a page's costume is made to mount upon a table and is covered by a wicker cone which being almost instantly removed he or she has vanished the table in this case is draped to within a few inches of the ground but to show that no hidden receptacle is thereby concealed the performer before commencing the trick lifts up the tablecloth and shows that the top of the table is at most not more than two or three inches in thickness the drapery is then again allowed to fall into position and the trick proceeds the table used in this trick is a bellows table i e it has a double top or rather two tops one above the other the upper one is a fixture with a large wooden trap opening upwards in it to allow of the passage of the person to be conjured away 
the undertop is movable being in its normal condition pressed against the upper one by the action of four spiral springs one in each leg of the table but sinking down to nearly the depth of the cover under the weight of a person stepping upon it and thus affording the requisite hiding place in which the person remains until the fall of the curtain enables him or her to come forth with safety cloth is nailed round three sides of the upper and lower boards folding between the two when closed after the manner of the leather of a bellows and from this circumstance the table derives its name small round tables for the disappearance of a rabbit or the like are sometimes made on the same principle the following will be found a simple convenient arrangement let the table be of the form shown in figure 281 and two feet seven inches high let the uppermost eight inches of the pillar be a plain cylinder a a an inch and a half in diameter below this the pillar may increase in size and may be of an ornamental character take two circular boards of deal or mahogany each eighteen to twenty inches in diameter and five-eighths of an inch thick in the center of one of them b cut a circular hole an inch and three-quarters in diameter this will form the underside of the bellows the object being to allow the board to slide freely up and down on a a the other board which we will call c is screwed firmly on to the pillar to form the top of the table next take a strip of black alpaca ten inches in width and nail its opposite edges round b and c leaving a small space at the one side to give access to the interior tie a piece of cord elastic round the center of the alpaca tightly enough to exercise a considerable degree of tension fix such straps as may be desired in c and glue over it a fancy patterned cloth with a fringe or border hanging down nine or ten inches round the sides the performer before executing any trick with this table may pointedly draw attention to the fact that it contains no drawer or other place of concealment in doing this he with one hand raises the lower board level with the upper the action of the elastic drawing in the alpaca between the two while with the other hand he raises the fringe and shows apparently that the top of the table is but a single board the top of every conjuring table should be covered with woolen cloth not only to prevent the clatter which would be occasioned by the placing of objects upon the bare wood but to conceal the presence of the traps and pistons the cloth should for this latter reason be of two colors and of a tolerably intricate pattern as the outline of the traps will be thereby rendered much less perceptible indeed if the pattern of the cloth be a favorable one for the purpose the traps should be by gaslight absolutely invisible the cloth should be glued over the top of the table after the manner of a card table the upper surface of the traps being first roughed slightly to make the glue adhere to the metal when the glue is thoroughly dry but not until then the cloth may be cut along the outline of the traps with a very sharp penknife and small holes bored to allow of the upward passage of the piston rods as it is necessary in placing a mechanical piece upon the table to do so exactly over the pistons it is well to have a couple of wire points projecting upwards a quarter of an inch or so from the surface of the table in such positions that if the piece of apparatus rests firmly against these which the performer can tell instantly by feel it must necessarily be in proper position where wrist traps are used the cloth need not be cut out round the little oblong slab marked c in figures 263 and 264 but the cloth should be without glue over this particular spot and for half an inch round it on either side the cloth will by this arrangement be found without cutting to stretch sufficiently over c to allow of the proper working of the trap assuming that our stage appliances are complete we will proceed to the rabbit trick the performer comes forward to the audience and borrows a hat he asks whether it is empty and is answered that it is but he notwithstanding finds something in it which the owner is requested to take out the article in question proves to be an egg no sooner has this been removed than the performer discovers that there is still something in the hat and immediately produces therefrom a live rabbit quickly followed by a second not knowing what other use to make of these he proposes to pass one of them in to the other the audience decide which is to be the victim and the performer placing them side by side on the table proceeds to roll them together when one is found to have vanished nobody knows when or how but the theory is that it has been swallowed by the remaining rabbit 
to the imaginary increased fatness of which the performer draws special attention having thus passed one rabbit into the other the next step is to get it out again to do this the performer calls for some bran and his assistant immediately brings forward and places on a table or chair a huge glass goblet twelve inches or thereabouts in height filled to the brim with that commodity the performer takes the borrowed hat and after showing that it is empty places it mouth upward on another table so as to be at some considerable distance from the goblet of bran he then places a brass cover over the glass first, however, taking up and scattering a handful of the bran to prove its genuineness. Taking the surviving rabbit and holding it by the ears above the covered goblet, he orders the one swallowed to pass from it into the glass, at the same time stroking it down with the disengaged hand as though to facilitate the process. He remarks, You must excuse the comparative slowness of the operation, ladies and gentlemen but the fact is the second rabbit passes downwards in an impalpable powder and if i were not to take sufficient time we might find that a leg or an ear had been omitted in the process and the restored rabbit would be a cripple for life i think we are pretty safe by this time however thank you bunny i need not trouble you any more so saying he releases the visible rabbit and on taking off the cover the bran is found to have disappeared and the missing rabbit to have taken its place in the goblet while, on turning over the borrowed hat, the vanished bran pours from it. The reader who has duly followed our descriptions of the appliances employed in the magic art will have little difficulty in solving the riddle of this trick. The performer first comes forward with an egg palmed in one hand and with a small rabbit in an inner breast pocket on each side of his coat. See page 9. The first step is that pretended finding of something. It is not stated what in the hat the owner is requested to take it out and while all eyes are naturally turned to see what the article may prove to be the performer without apparent intention presses the mouth of the hat with both hands to his breast and tilts one of the rabbits into it this is next produced and in placing it on the ground at its feet the performer brings the second rabbit in the same manner into the hat when he undertakes to pass one rabbit into the other he places both upon the table which contains the rabbit trap and standing sideways to the audience pushes the hindmost under cover of the other through the trap this particular rabbit is not again produced the rabbit in the bran glass which has already been explained see page three eighty three being another as much like it as possible it only remains to explain how the bran comes into the borrowed hat this is effected by having a black alpaca bag filled with bran in one of the profondas or under the waistcoat of the performer this bag is introduced into the hat after the manner of the goblets see page three o eight and the bran having been allowed to run out the bag is rolled up in the palm and so removed the bran remaining to be produced in due course it is obvious that the trick may be varied in many ways the following is an effective modification a rabbit having been produced by natural or supernatural means is placed on the principal table closer to the hinder edge and temporarily covered with a borrowed hat while the performer goes in search of a sheet of paper which when obtained he spreads upon a small side table lifting the hat slightly he takes out the rabbit and walking with it to the side table rolls it up in the paper making a somewhat bulky parcel coming forward with this to the audience he turns toward the principal table and saying now ladies and gentlemen if you watch me very closely you will see the rabbit fly out of the paper and back to the hat he crushes the paper together between his hands and tearing it shows it's empty while on lifting the hat the rabbit is again found safely ensconced beneath it the ingenious reader will readily guess that duplicate rabbits are employed one of them is placed under the hat and remains there throughout the trick a second of similar appearance is placed in the box or basket on the servante immediately behind the hat this box has no lid but is pushed until wanted just within the interior of the table the top of which prevents the rabbit making a premature appearance the performer slightly raising the hat as though to take the rabbit from under it lifts up this second rabbit which the spectators naturally believe to be the same one which they have already seen and in apparently wrapping it in paper on the side table presses it under cover of the paper through the rabbit trap and screws up the ends of the paper which should be rather stiff in such manner as to make it appear that the animal is still inside it the same trick may be performed with a pigeon with equally good effect and considerably less difficulty the fairy star this is one of the most telling of stage card tricks the performer coming forward with a pack of cards allows six to be chosen his assistant meanwhile brings forward and places on a table a handsome gilt star on a stand 
the performer collecting the chosen cards places them in his pistol and fires them at the star when at the moment of each explosion they are seen to attach themselves one to each of its points as in figure 283 the principal point to be explained is the construction of the star behind each ray is a movable arm working on a spring hinge at about two inches distance from the point and carrying a spring clip at its outer end wherein to insert a card see figure 284 representing a back view of the apparatus a card being placed in each of the clips the six arms with the cards attached to them are folded down one by one behind the center of the star which is just large enough to conceal them each card as folded holds down the one which has preceded it when the last card is folded down the free end of a movable button or lever at the top of the pillar on which the star rests is so turned as to press upon the arm which holds the card last folded and thus to keep it and the five other cards preceding it in its place the button however is so arranged as to be instantly withdrawn upon an upward movement being communicated to a wire rod which passes up the center of the pillar and terminates in a flat disc of metal at its foot the apparatus thus prepared is placed immediately over one of the pistons of the table at the moment of firing the pistol the cord of the piston is pulled the piston rises pressing up the disc and wire rod the button is withdrawn and the arms being thereby released revert to their natural position exhibiting a card upon each point of the star there are many little differences of detail between the stars of rival manufacturers but the foregoing may be taken to represent the general principle of all some have the addition of a rose in the center which opens simultaneously with the appearance of the cards and discloses a watch borrowed a moment previously from one of the spectators the mode of working the trick varies a good deal in the hands of different performers the most legitimate method is to force cards corresponding to those already folded behind the star and this method has the advantage of allowing the star to be brought in and placed upon the table before commencing the trick and as it is not again touched by the performer or his assistant the appearance on its points of apparently the identical cards just chosen seems really miraculous to be able however to force six cards in succession with ease and certainty demands a more than average degree of dexterity on the part of the performer and a forcing pack see page twenty three is hardly available where more than three or at most four cards have to be forced various expedients have been adopted to get over this difficulty some professors simply collect or allow their assistant to collect the cards which have been drawn and forthwith secretly exchange them for the same number of others these latter are laid upon the table and subsequently placed in the pistol while the originals are carried off by the assistant behind the scenes and there attached to the star which is then for the first time brought forward others again use what are called longs and shorts i e two packs of cards one of which has a small portion shaved off its length or breadth the performer offers the uncut pack for the company to draw from letting each person retain his card and then secretly exchanging the pack for the shortened pack he requests each of the drawers singly to replace his card and to shuffle freely the substituted pack being a shade smaller than the returned card the latter becomes a long card see page sixty and therefore however well the cards are shuffled the performer is able with absolute certainty to cut at that particular card here is your card he remarks the knave of diamonds as he names the card the assistant behind the scenes takes the cue and attaches a corresponding card to the star the card named is removed from the pack and laid upon the table in order to be subsequently placed in the pistol and a second drawn card is returned and shuffled with the like result the star may in the absence of a mechanical table be placed on the hand the disc being pushed up by the fingers some stars have a movable stud at the side of the pillar connected with the rod within to facilitate this mode of working the trick the card bouquet this is a trick very similar in effect to that last described though differing a little as to the manner of the appearance of the cards six cards are drawn and placed in a pistol as in the last case a vase apparently of china but really of tin japanned containing a handsome bouquet is placed upon the table and at the instant of firing the six cards appear ranged in a semicircle above the flowers in the bouquet in this instance the cards are attached to the branches of a sort of fan so constructed as to open of its own accord unless forcibly kept closed the cards having been duly placed in position this fan is shut and pressed downward through a narrow opening in the lower part of the vase the pressure of whose sides keep it for the time being closed 
when pressed upwards by the action of a piston the fan rises above the level of the flowers and at the same time opens and exhibits the six cards the vase is sometimes made with a second petal to produce a second series of six cards in this case twelve cards are drawn six of these first appear and then at the command of the performer these six suddenly change to the other six this is effected as follows the twelve cards are pasted back to back in couples each of the six arms which hold the cards is so arranged as to be capable of being turned half round after the manner of the center of the watch target in which position it is retained by a catch flying back however to its old position as soon as the catch is released the six arms are each turned round in this manner bringing what are naturally the hindmost cards in front the movement of the first lever exhibits these cards that of the second lever releases the six catches when the arms instantly fly round and reveal the other six cards into which those first exhibited appear to have changed end of section 47section 48 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor louis hoffman stage tricks part 3 the demon's head this is a large and effective piece of apparatus standing about 28 inches from the table It consists of a grotesque papier-mâché head Representing that of a demon or satyr and painted according to taste It is supported by an ornamental brass column about an inch in diameter Springing from a velvet covered base nine inches square and four and a half high see figure 286 at the will of the operator the head rolls its eyes and opens its mouth and is sometimes made available in this way to answer questions the rolling of the eyes being taken to signify negative and the opening of the mouth an affirmative in addition to these accomplishments the demon will indicate chosen cards in the following manner five cards having been selected are returned to the pack which after being duly shuffled is placed in the demon's mouth the performer now orders him to produce the chosen cards when two of them fly from his mouth and the other two spring up between the horns the head owes its movements to the action of three different sets of levers each terminating in a disc or pedal immediately over the circular hole in the underside of the base the apparatus is so placed upon the table that these openings correspond in position with the same number of pistons figure 287 is a general view of the internal mechanism the back of the head being removed as in fact it may be in the original to give access thereto figure 288 exhibits as seen from the rear the action of the left hand group of levers producing the movement of the eyes when the upward pressure is applied to the foot of the lever a it causes the upper arm c d of the elbow piece b c d to describe an arc of about a quarter of an inch from the left to right thereby communicating a corresponding movement to the pair of levers e e working on the pivots f f and as a necessary consequence a reverse movement to the opposite ends of such levers on which are fixed the eyes g g as soon as the upward pressure is removed the spring h a spiral coil of fine brass wire draws back the levers e e and with them the eyes to their original position to produce a continuous rolling the pressure of the piston is applied and relaxed alternately the effect to the spectator being as if the figure looked first to the left and then to the right although as we already explained the active movement of the levers is in the one direction only the normal position of the eyes being in the other direction figure 289 shows the action of the second or middle group of levers serving to produce the opening of the mouth the chin of the figure consists of a solid block of wood i working on a pivot j 
in each cheek and so counterweighted that its normal position is as in figure 289 thus keeping the mouth closed when however the shaft k is raised by pressure from below the lever l rises with it and proportionately depresses the opposite end of the block i thereby opening the mouth as soon as the pressure is removed the block falls back into its original position and the mouth closes the third or right hand set of levers is a little more complex in its operation inasmuch as it has to perform a double office the expulsion of two cards from the mouth and the elevation of two others at the top of the head the cards to be shot from the mouth are placed beforehand from the front in the receptacle indicated in figure 289 by the letters mm and a plan of which is given in figure 290 and a back view in figure 291 mm is a flat piece of tin its edges folded over so as to form a receptacle or platform just capable of holding easily a couple of cards n is a spring which when the cards are put in position is set by being drawn back into the notch of the catch o when an upward pressure is exerted by the shaft pp on the elbow piece qqq the latter pressing against r draws back this catch and releases the spring which forthwith shoots out the two cards from the mouth the other two cards are inserted in the clip see figure 291 consisting of two small pieces of sheet brass soldered to the end of the rod t which works up and down piston wise in the tube u u within the tube is a spiral spring which impels s upwards level with the top of the head across which a slit or opening is made to allow of the passage of the cards this portion of the apparatus is set by placing the two cards in the clip and then drawing down the piston rod by the cross piece v which is riveted thereto and hitching such cross piece under the catch w the upward movement of the shaft p at the same time that it draws back the catch o also draws back the catch w thereby releasing v and allowing the clip s and the two cards therein to spring upward and appear at the top of the head it is hardly necessary to remark that the cards chosen by the audience are forced cards of which duplicates have beforehand been placed in the head the magic picture frame the performer always borrowing borrows this time a lady's handkerchief and any small articles say a watch and a glove these latter he rolls up in the handkerchief and places the ball or bundle thus made upon the table he looks about in search of his magic pistol which is immediately afterwards brought in by the assistant the performer places the handkerchief etc in the pistol the assistant meanwhile bringing forward and placing on the table a handsome picture frame mounted on a stand it contains no picture the space which the picture should occupy being filled by a board covered with black cloth the performer standing at the farthest available distance from the frame takes aim at it and fires when the borrowed articles are seen instantly to attach themselves to the black background whence being removed they are handed to the owners for identification the picture frame which is of the appearance shown in figure 292 and stands altogether about two feet high is backed by a sort of wooden box an inch and a half in depth and a little smaller than the external measurement of the frame the inside of this box is covered with black cloth and in fact forms the true back of the frame and it is upon this that the borrowed objects are fastened by means of small sharp hooks the back opening on hinges to facilitate the doing so an ordinary spring roller blind also of black cloth works up and down just behind the opening of the frame we have said an ordinary spring blind but in truth the usual check at the side is wanting and the blind therefore if drawn down instantly flies up again unless held down from below the blind terminates at bottom 
in a square lathe five eighths of an inch in length by three eighths in thickness with a wire pin half an inch in length projecting at right angles from its hinder side the ends of this lathe when the blind is drawn down sink into two upright grooves one at each side of the frame thereby keeping the latter square and the pin in a horizontal position the catch a an enlarged view of which is shown in figures 293 and 294 is now hooked over the pin as in figure 293 thus holding the blind down a wire rod attached to this catch passes down the column on which the frame stands and terminates in the usual disc or pedal at bottom when an upward pressure is applied to this the catch assumes the position shown in figure 294 thereby releasing the pin and allowing the blind to fly up the blind is represented in figure 292 in the act of flying up but in truth its rise is so rapid as to be practically invisible the sudden appearance of the articles in the frame is thus sufficiently accounted for but it remains to be explained in what manner they were placed there as they have apparently never been removed from the sight of the audience it will be remembered that the smaller articles were rolled up in the handkerchief which was then placed on the table in truth what is placed upon the table is a substitute handkerchief similarly rolled up while the original is dropped into the servante and carried off by the assistant when he brings in the pistol having thus obtained possession of the articles he quickly places them in the frame and draws down and fastens the blind this done he closes the door at the back and brings forward the frame taking care to place it immediately over one of the pistons of the table as the pistol is fired he pulls a cord and the blind flies up and the articles are revealed the flying watches and the broken plate this is a rather more elaborate form of the trick last described the performer collects three or four watches from the company the assistant meanwhile being sent to fetch a plate on his return the watches are laid one by one on the plate and he is ordered to place them on the table in attempting to do so he trips and falls the watches being scattered in all directions and the plate being smashed to pieces the performer reprimands the offender for his carelessness and picking up the watches finds that they are injured in various ways after a momentary hesitation he hits on a way of repairing the damage calling for his pistol he drops the battered watches and the fragments of the plate into it keeping all down with a wad of newspaper the assistant now brings in the picture frame as in the last trick and the performer taking good aim fires at it at the instant of firing the plate is seen restored in the center of the frame with the borrowed watches encircling it the performer advances to remove and return them to the owners but is or appears to be thunderstruck at perceiving that the restoration is incomplete a large piece being missing from the plate see figure 295 after a moment's reflection he discovers the cause of the defect for looking about upon the stage he finds and picks up a fragment which he had overlooked when he put the rest in the pistol and which consequently is wanting in the restored plate he apologizes for the oversight and proceeds to remedy it standing at the furthest portion of the stage he makes the motion of throwing the recovered fragment towards the frame it is seen to vanish from his hand and the plate at the same moment appears whole as at first the plate is removed and with the restored watches handed to the audience for examination where the closest inspection fails to discover any trace of fracture the first point to be explained is the mode in which the assistant obtains the possession of the borrowed watches in order to place them in the frame the watches are collected by the performer in a changing apparatus say one of the changing caddies described at page 348 or a drawer box with a shallow inner drawer as described at page 346 in this is placed beforehand a like number of dummy watches and it is this latter 
which are placed on the plate and meet the predestined downfall the apparatus being left apparently empty no suspicion is excited by the fact that the assistant when sent to fetch the pistol or the frame carries it off as no longer needed the sudden restoration of the piece apparently wanting in the plate though marvelous to the uninitiated is really effected by very simple means the restored plate is thoroughly whole and unbroken but the effect of a piece wanting is produced by covering one portion of its outer rim with an angular piece of black velvet or alpaca similar to that which covers the back of the frame the elusive effect is perfect the frame is provided with two pedals the first releasing the black blind in front of the plate and watches and the second serving to withdraw the angular piece of cloth already mentioned and thus apparently effecting the complete restoration of the plate the pretended disappearance of the broken piece from the hand at the moment of throwing is effected by taking it first in the left hand and thence apparently transferring it to the right by the tourniquet so that when the right hand is opened in the act of throwing it is naturally found empty the magic picture and the chosen cards we notice this trick in this place as having a very close affinity in effect to the two last described it is however wholly independent of stage appliances and is equally well adapted for the drawing room as for the platform the performer taking an ordinary pack of cards allows three to be chosen these are returned to the pack and the pack shuffled he then brings forward a small picture in a frame and measuring say 14 inches by 12 having exhibited both front and back he entrusts the picture to a spectator to hold and taking the pack of cards throws them smartly against the glass when in an instant the three chosen cards appear in front of the picture but under the glass the back of the frame is next taken out and picture back frame and glass are separately handed for inspection but the closest scrutiny of the audience cannot discover any mechanism or special arrangement to account for the effect above described the reader will already have anticipated that the three cards are forced the picture is on the principle of the frames last above described with a slight variation there are in fact two pictures exactly alike one of these is pasted upon the wooden back of the frame and upon this are fastened duplicates of the cards to be chosen the second picture is mounted on cloth and works on a spring roller artfully concealed in the upper part of the frame taking in fact the place of the black blind in the other frames this is kept down by a pin at the lowest side of the frame and is so arranged as to be released by the smallest pressure against the glass the pack of cards smartly thrown supplies this pressure the foremost picture flies up and reveals apparently the same but really a similar picture with the chosen cards between it and the glass the magic portfolio the performer comes forward with a large portfolio such as is used to contain engravings and barely an inch in thickness this he places sideways to the audience upon a stand or trestle thereby raising it to a convenient height and at the same time negativing the possibility of its having any communication with the floor of the stage standing behind it he proceeds to take from it a number of large engravings then a couple of ladies bonnets of the latest fashion and showing no sign of creasing or compression these are followed by a large bird cage containing a number of living birds and finally by three brass stew pans one containing haricot beans a second water and a third fire other articles are sometimes produced but the above are the most generally used this really surprising trick is performed by the simplest possible means the bonnets and the bird cage are made to fold nearly flat on the principle of the reticules and bird cages described at pages 309 and 311 in this flattened condition they are placed in the portfolio which being turned sideways to the audience and the performer standing behind it 
the side which is towards the spectators naturally forms a cover for the operator and gives him every facility for developing the folded articles the stew pans however cannot be made thus compressible and consequently a different plan is adopted in respect to them these have india rubber covers after the manner of the bowls of goldfish and like them are concealed about the person of the performer who producing them under the cover of the portfolio appears to take them out of it the pan for the fire contains a little spirits of wine which the performer still behind the portfolio ignites with a wax match before producing this particular pan where it is desired to produce a child or other specially bulky object the portfolio is for a moment placed on the table behind which such object is placed the object having been introduced into the portfolio the latter is then transferred to the proper stand the glove column this is an ornamental column sometimes of brass sometimes of glass on a massive foot and standing about two and a half feet high it is surmounted by a metal cup about an inch and a half in depth and two inches in diameter the mode of using the column is as follows three or four rings are borrowed also a white kid glove and the whole are placed in the magic pistol the column is then brought in and placed upon the table the magician takes aim at it and fires at the instant of his doing so the glove expanded as though containing a living hand appears at the top of the pillar with one of the borrowed rings on each of its fingers the glove and the rings as the reader will probably conjecture are exchanged at an early period of the trick there are plenty of ways of effecting this exchange perhaps as regard the rings the expedient of having them collected on the performer's wand by the assistant see page 399 is as good as any the assistant having thus gained possession of the borrowed articles arranges them as follows the glove is placed upon the end of a tube which runs through the whole length of the column terminating just within the cup at top and is kept in position by an india rubber ring slipped over it and holding it tight to the tube one of the borrowed rings is now placed over each of the fingers and the glove thus prepared is pressed down into the cup so as not to show above the rim the column is now placed upon the table in such manner that the lower opening of the tube shall correspond with a small black hole in the table communicating by means of an india rubber tube with a hollow ball of the same material filled with air and so placed as to be within reach of the hand or foot of the assistant at the moment of firing a smart pressure is applied to the ball thus causing a rush of air through the tube and inflating the glove which instantly springs up into a perpendicular position with the rings upon it the articles are now returned to the owners and are identified as those which were borrowed some columns have a large hollow black or gilt ball at the top divided vertically into two parts and so arranged as to fall apart at the moment of the inflation of the glove end of section 48section 49 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman Stage Tricks, Part 4 The Vanishing Pocket Handkerchief Found in a Candle This was a favorite trick of Robert Howden, by whom we believe it was invented. The performer borrows a lady's handkerchief, drawing particular attention to the fact that he takes the first handkerchief which may be offered, and that it is wholly free from preparation. Fixing upon some gentleman among the audience, he asks him if he thinks he could set fire to the handkerchief. The person addressed naturally expresses his belief that he could. 
The performer ventures to doubt it and at once fetches a lighted candle to enable him to try the experiment, meanwhile spreading the borrowed handkerchief over the top of a small round table or guéridon, where it remains in full view of the spectators, showing clearly that it is not tampered with in any way. Returning with the candle, the performer hands it to the gentleman and requests him to go and set fire to the handkerchief. Hardly, however, has he taken the first step to do so when the handkerchief suddenly vanishes, its disappearance being so rapid that the spectators cannot even decide in which direction it traveled. The performer accuses the gentleman, who is still holding the candlestick, of having the handkerchief about him. This he naturally denies. The professor insists, and after keeping up the dispute as long as the audience are amused by it, offers to prove his assertion, and taking the candle from the candlestick, breaks it in half, and produces from it the borrowed handkerchief, which is immediately identified by the owner. This capital trick requires the aid of a special table. The top is thin and without fringe or ornament of any kind, allowing no apparent space for the concealment of even the smallest article. The center pillar, however, is a hollow tube, and it is into this that the handkerchief is made to vanish. The first step in the trick is to exchange the handkerchief for a substitute, see page 240. This substitute is spread over the top of the table. The real handkerchief the performer carries with him when he leaves the stage under the pretense of fetching the candle, and utilizes his momentary absence in placing it inside the candle, which is hollow, and of the description mentioned at page 251. When the gentleman advances to set fire to the handkerchief, the pulling of a string by the assistant causes a clip to rise up in the center of the table and nip the middle of the handkerchief, which is instantly drawn down within the tube through a small trap at its upper extremity. The Sphinx Few tricks have of late years caused so great a sensation as this now well-known illusion, which was first introduced to the London public by the late Colonel Stodare in 1865. We cannot better preface the explanation of the trick than by quoting a portion of the Times notice on the subject of October 19, 1865. Most intricate is the problem proposed by Colonel Stodare, when, in addition to his admirable feats of ventriloquism and ledger domain, he presents to his patrons a novel illusion called the Sphinx. Placing upon an uncovered table a chest similar in size to the cases commonly occupied by stuffed dogs or foxes, he removes the side facing the spectators and reveals a head attired after the fashion of an Egyptian sphinx. To avoid the suspicion of ventriloquism, he retires to a distance from the figure supposed to be too great for the practice of that art, taking his position on the borderline of the stalls and the area, while the chest is on the stage. Thus stationed, he calls upon the sphinx to open its eyes, which it does, to smile, which it does also, though the habitual expression of its countenance is most melancholy, and to make a speech, which it does also, this being the miraculous part of the exhibition. Not only with perspicuity, but with something like eloquence, does it utter some twenty lines of verse, and while its countenance is animated and expressive, the movement of the lips, in which there is nothing mechanical, exactly corresponds to the sounds articulated. This is certainly one of the most extraordinary illusions ever presented to the public. That the speech is spoken by a human voice, there is no doubt. But how is a head to be contrived, which, being detached from anything like a body, confined in a case which it completely fills, and placed on a bare-legged table, will accompany a speech that apparently proceeds from its lips with a strictly appropriate movement of the mouth, and a play of the countenance that is the reverse of mechanical? Eels, as we all know, can wriggle about after they have been chopped into half a dozen pieces. But a head, that like that of the physician Dubin in the Arabian Tales, pursues its eloquence after it has been severed from its body, scarcely comes within the reach of possibilities. Unless, indeed, the old-fashioned assertion that King Charles walked and talked half an hour after his head was cut off is to be received, not as an illustration of defective punctuation, but as a positive historical statement. Davis might have solved the anthropoglossus, but Colonel Stodare presents us with a sphinx that is really worthy of an Oedipus. For the benefit of those who have never seen this illusion presented upon the stage, we will describe its effect a little more minutely. 
The Sphinx is always made a separate portion of the entertainment, as it is necessary to lower the curtain for a few moments before and after its appearance, in order to arrange and remove the necessary preparations. The curtain rises and reveals a round or oval table supported upon three slender legs and utterly devoid of drapery. This stands in a curtain recess of 10 or 12 feet square, open on the side towards the audience. The performer comes forward bearing a cloth-covered box, 15 to 20 inches square, and places it upon the table already mentioned. He then unlocks the box, the front of which drops down, so as to give a perfect view of the interior in which is seen a head of Egyptian fashion and colored in perfect imitation of life. See frontispiece. The performer now retires to a position in the very midst of the audience, and raising his wand says in a tone of command, Sphinx, awake! The sphinx slowly opens its eyes, looking first to the front with a strong gaze, then, as if gradually gaining consciousness, to the one side and the other, the head moving slightly with the eyes. Questions are put by the performer to the head and are answered by it, the play of the mouth and features being in perfect harmony with the sounds uttered. Finally, in answer to a query of the operator, the sphinx declaims a neatly turned oracle in verse. This concludes the exhibition and the performer closes the box. Should the audience call for an encore, the performer addresses them to the following or some similar effect. Ladies and gentlemen, I am glad that the Sphinx has afforded you satisfaction, and I should be only too pleased to be able to indulge the desire which you kindly testify of seeing it again. Unfortunately, this is not possible. The charm by which I am enabled, as you have seen, to revivify for a space the ashes of an ancient Egyptian who lived and died some centuries ago, lasts but for fifteen minutes. That time has now expired, and the head which has astonished you with its mysterious eloquence has again returned to its original dust. As he speaks the last words, he again opens the box, and the head is found to have disappeared, leaving in its place a handful of ashes. This singular illusion depends upon the well-known principle, common to optics as to mechanics, that the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. Thus, if a person standing at the point A in figure 296 look into a mirror placed in the position indicated by the line BC, he will see reflected not himself, but whatever object may be placed at the point D. By an ingenious application of this principle, a looking glass may be used to conceal a given object behind it, while at the same time an image reflected in the glass may be made to represent what would be presumably seen if no glass were there, and thus prevent the presence of the mirror from being suspected. This is the secret of the Sphinx. The table, as already mentioned, has three legs, one in front and one at each side. Between these legs, the spectator sees apparently the curtains at the back of the recess, but really a reflection of the curtains at the sides. The space between the middle leg and that on either side is occupied by pieces of looking glass, see figure 297, which represents a ground plan of the arrangement, extending from A to B and A to C. The glass extends quite down to the floor, which is covered with cloth of the same material and color as the surrounding curtains. The spectators, therefore, looking towards the table, see above it the curtains at the back and below it the reflection of the curtains at the sides, which, however, if the relative angles are properly arranged, appears to be simply the continuation or lower portion of the curtains at the back. The illusion is perfect, and the spectator, from the position assigned to him, cannot possibly discover, by the evidence of his senses, that he is looking at any other than an ordinary bare-legged table, with the background visible in the usual way. The rest is a very simple matter. The person who is to represent the Sphinx is beforehand placed, duly attired, underneath the table. There is a trap in the table through which he can pass his head at the proper moment. This trap is a round piece of wood covered to match the surface of the table and working on a hinge on the side nearest to the audience. It has no spring but is kept closed by means of a button on the opposite side and when released hangs down perpendicularly. It must be large enough to allow the passage of the somewhat elaborate headpiece of the sphinx and would therefore leave an open space visible round the neck. This difficulty is met by the expedient of having a wooden collar, whose upper surface is a facsimile in size and pattern of the trap, fastened round the neck of the representative of the Sphinx. 
When he lifts his head up through the trap, this collar exactly fills the opening and thus shows no break in the surface of the table. The box is bottomless and when brought forward by the performer is empty. A little caution has to be observed in placing it upon the table, for if the performer were to approach the table from the side, his legs would be reflected in the glass and would thereby betray the secret. He must therefore make his appearance from some quarter outside of the curtain recess and advance to a position well in front of and at some little distance from the table, when, by moving in a straight line from the audience towards the middle leg A, he prevents this inconvenient reflection. The placing the box upon the table and the unlocking it allow time for the representative of the Sphinx to get his head into position within it. This done, the box is opened, and the rest depends on the dramatic talent of the performer and his assistant. The performance being concluded, the box is again locked and the head withdrawn, a handful of ashes being introduced on the trap in its stead. The angle at which the two mirrors should be set cannot be determined absolutely, but will vary according to the distance and position of the surrounding drapery. Some performers use a shawl or a screen of cardboard in place of the box, but we doubt whether any method is more effective than that above described. The ghastly illusion of the so-called decapitated head, which drew crowds to the polytechnic some few years since, was merely the sphinx in a less pleasant form. The Cabinet of Proteus This is another adaptation of the principle on which the Sphinx illusion is founded. It is the joint inventions of Messrs. Pepper and Tobin, by whom it was patented in 1865. The first steps towards a patent for the Sphinx were also taken in the same year, but the latter invention never proceeded beyond provisional protection. The Cabinet of Proteus is a wooden closet, seven to eight feet in height by four or five feet square, supported on short legs so as to exclude the idea of any communication with the floor. See figure 298. It has folding doors and an upright pillar extends from top to bottom of the interior at about the center of the cabinet. At the top of this pillar in front is fixed a lamp so that the whole of the interior is brightly illuminated. The cabinet may be used in various ways. One of the most striking is as follows. The folding doors are open, disclosing the interior perfectly empty. See figure 299. The exhibitor directs his assistant to walk into the cabinet. He does so, and the doors are closed. Meanwhile, a couple of gentlemen, selected by the audience, are invited to stand behind or beside the cabinet and see that no one obtains ingress or egress by any secret opening. Notwithstanding these precautions, when the doors are again opened, the assistant is found to have vanished, and another person, different in dress, in stature, and in complexion, is found in his place. This person steps forth, makes his bow, and retires. Again the cabinet, now empty, is closed, and after an interval of a few moments, again opened. This time a human skeleton is found to occupy the vacant space. This ghastly object having been removed, and the door having been once more closed and opened, another person, say a lady, appears. This person having retired, the doors are again closed, and when they are again opened, the person who first entered is once more found within. A committee from the audience are now invited to examine the cabinet within and without, but all their scrutiny cannot detect any hidden space, even sufficient to conceal a mouse. An examination of figure 300, representing the ground plan of the cabinet, will make plain the seeming mystery. A movable flap AB, working on hinges at B, extends from top to bottom of each side, resting when thrown open against the post C in the middle, and thus enclosing a triangular space in the back of the cabinet. The outer surfaces of these flaps, i.e. the surfaces exposed when they are folded back against the sides of the cabinet, are, like the rest of the interior, covered with wallpaper of a crimson or other dark color. The opposite sides of the flaps are of looking glass. When the flaps are folded back against the posts, reflect the surfaces against which they previously rested, and which are covered with paper of the same pattern as the rest. The effect to the eye of the spectator is that of a perfectly empty chamber, though, as we have seen, there is in reality an enclosed triangular space behind the post. This is capable of containing two or three persons, and here it is that the persons and things intended to appear in succession are concealed. 
The assistant, entering inside of the audience, changes places as soon as the door is closed with one of the other persons. This person having retired, and the door being again closed, those who are still within place the skeleton in position in front of the post, and again retire to their hiding place. When all the rest have appeared, the person who first entered presses the flaps against the sides of the cabinet, against which they are retained by a spring lock on each side, and the public may then safely be admitted, as their closest inspection cannot possibly discover the secret. The Indian Basket Trick This is another of the sensational feats identified with the name of Colonel Stodare, and is imitated from a similar illusion performed by the Indian conjurers. It is not a pleasant trick to witness, but, like the decapitated head, it drew immense crowds, its fictitious horror being apparently its chief attraction. Its effect, as the trick was originally presented by Stodare, is as follows. A large oblong basket, say five feet by two, and as deep as wide, is brought in, and placed on a low stand or bench so as to be raised clear of the stage. The performer comes forward with a drawn sword in his right hand, and leading with the other hand a young lady, dressed in a closely fitting robe of black velvet. Reproaching her upon some pretended ground of complaint, he declares that she must be punished, and forthwith begins to blindfold her eyes. She simulates terror, begging for mercy, and finally escaping from him, runs off the stage. He follows her and instantly reappears, dragging her by the wrist. Regardless of her sobs and cries, he compels her to enter the basket in which she lies down and the lid is closed. Simulating an access of fury, he thrusts the sword through the basket from the front in various places. Piercing screams are heard from the interior, and the sword when withdrawn is seen to be red with blood. The screams gradually subside and all is still. A thrill of horror runs through the audience, who are half inclined to call in the police and hand over the professor to the nearest magistrate. For a moment there is a pause, and then the performer, calmly wiping the bloody sword on a white pocket handkerchief, says, Ladies and gentlemen, I fear you imagine that I have hurt the lady who is the subject of this experiment. Pray disabuse yourselves of such an idea. She had disobeyed me, and I therefore determined to punish her by giving her a little fright, but nothing more. The fact is, she had left the basket some time before I thrust the sword into it. You don't believe me, I see. Allow me to show you, in the first place, that the basket is empty. He turns over the basket accordingly and shows that the lady has vanished. Should you desire further proof, the lady will answer for herself. The lady at this moment comes forward from a different portion of the room and, having made her bow, retires. This startling illusion is performed as follows. To begin with, there are two ladies employed, in figure and general appearance as nearly alike as possible. Their dress is also exactly similar. The little dramatic scene with which the trick commences is designed to impress upon the audience the features of the lady who first appears. When she is blindfolded, she, as already mentioned, runs off the stage. The performer runs after her, and apparently bringing her back, really brings back in her place the second lady, who is standing in readiness, blindfolded in precisely the same way, behind the scenes. As the bandage covers the greater part of her features, there is little fear of the spectators detecting the substitution that has taken place. The substitute lady now enters the basket, where she lies, compressing herself into as small a compass as possible along the back. Knowing the position which she occupies, it is not a very difficult matter for the operator so to direct the thrusts of the sword as to avoid any risk of injuring her. The chief thing to be attended to for this purpose is to thrust always in an upward direction. The appearance of blood on the sword may be produced either by the lady in the basket drawing along the blade, as it is withdrawn after each thrust, a sponge saturated with some crimson fluid or by a mechanical arrangement in the hilt, causing the supposed blood on pressure to trickle down the blade. The only point that remains to be explained is the difficulty which will probably already have suggested itself to the reader, viz. how does the performer manage to show the basket empty at the close of the trick? Simply by having the basket made on the principle of the inexhaustible box, described at page 391. The performer takes care to tilt the basket over to the front before he raises the lid. 
This leaves the lady lying on the true bottom of the basket, see figure 302, while a movable flap fixed at right angles to the bottom and lying in its normal position against the front of the basket for the time being represents the bottom to the eyes of the audience. While the basket is thus shown apparently empty, the lady who first appeared in the trick comes forward and is immediately recognized by the audience. And as they are fully persuaded that she was the person placed in the basket, the inference that she has escaped from it by some quasi-supernatural means seems inevitable. The above is the form in which the trick was first introduced to the London public, but another modus operandi has since been adopted by some performers. The low table or bench on which the basket is placed is in this case constructed on the principle of the sphinx table with looking glass between the legs and with a large trap in the top. The basket used is not made like the inexhaustible box, but the bottom is movable and hinged against the front so as to lift up flat against it when required. One lady only is employed. When she is about to step into the basket, the bottom is pushed up from below, and she thus steps through the basket and the table, and thence passes through a trap door beneath the stage. The basket is then closed and the bottom allowed to fall back into its place. As the basket is left in this case empty, the performer may thrust into it in any direction at pleasure, the screams being uttered by the lady from her safe quarters below. At the proper moment, the performer lifts the basket bodily off the table and shows it really empty, while the lady, as in the former case, reappears in some other quarter. End of section 49. Recording by Caroline Shapiro. Section 50 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Louis Hoffman. Stage Tricks, Part 5. Electrical Tricks. Some of the most mysterious of the stage tricks are performed by means of electricity, or, to speak more correctly, of electromagnetism. In describing these, which are nearly all attributable to the inventive genius of Robert Houdin, it may be desirable, in the first place, to explain in a few words what electromagnetism is and how it operates. Every schoolboy is acquainted with the ordinary steel horseshoe magnet, and knows that if the accompanying small iron bar, or keeper, is placed within a short distance from its ends or poles, it will be sharply attracted to them. In the case of the ordinary magnet, this attractive force is permanent, but in that of the electromagnet it may be produced or destroyed at pleasure. The electromagnet consists of a short piece of soft iron, either straight or bent into a horseshoe form, with copper wire, covered with silk or cotton, wound round and round it nearly to the ends. If a current of electricity from a galvanic battery is made to pass through this wire, the iron core becomes powerfully magnetic, the attractive force, however, ceasing as soon as the current is interrupted. Almost any kind of battery may be used to produce the necessary current, but for magical purposes, one of the most convenient is the bichromate bottle battery, depicted in figure 302. This consists of a plate of zinc and a plate of carbon, or sometimes two plates of carbon, immersed in an exciting fluid, consisting of two ounces and a half of bichromate of potash, dissolved in a pint of water, with the addition of one-third of an ounce of sulfuric acid. The bottle is only filled to the top of the spherical portion, and the zinc is so arranged that it can be drawn up into the neck and so out of the solution when it is desired to suspend the action of the battery. The wires for conducting the current should be of copper covered with silk or cotton, and one of them must be connected with the zinc plate and the other with the carbon plate of the battery, which has binding screws affixed for this purpose. For the purpose of instantly completing or disconnecting the electric circuit, the wires are affixed to the opposite sides of what is called a connecting stud, see figure 303, being a circular disc of wood or porcelain with a movable stud or button in the center. On pressing this stud with the finger, 
the ends of the two wires are brought in contact and the circuit is completed but as soon as the pressure is removed the stud rises by the action of a spring and the circuit is again broken among the conjuring tricks depending upon the principle of electromagnetic attraction the simplest is that of the light and heavy chest this is a simple brass bound box with the ordinary handle at top the performer shows that it is empty and without mechanism or preparation having been duly inspected it is placed upon a small pedestal fixed to the stage when the performer requests that some gentleman of considerable personal strength will step forward a volunteer having been found the magician asks him whether he thinks he can lift the little box before him he naturally answers that he can and proves his assertion by lifting it accordingly which as the box only weighs a few pounds it is not very difficult to do wait a bit says the professor you were able to lift it then because it was my will and pleasure that you should do so it now weighs say six pounds i have only to breathe on it thus and it will instantly weigh two tons try if you can lift it now again he tries but the chest is as if glued to the pedestal and the most violent efforts cannot dislodge it once more the performer breathes upon it and it may be lifted with one finger the explanation may be given in half a dozen lines the bottom of the box is an iron plate the top of the pedestal is also an iron plate and within it is contained a powerful electromagnet the poles being in contact with the plate and the wires to convey the current passing beneath the stage to the hiding place of the assistant the latter on receiving his cue from the expressions of the performer presses the connecting stud and completes the circuit thereby bringing the magnetic force into operation upon again receiving an agreed signal from the performer he ceases to press the stud the circuit is broken and the iron ceases to possess any magnetic force this may be repeated as often as desired the above trick is cited by robert houdin in illustration of the great difference which there may be in point of effect between two modes of presenting the same illusion the reader may probably be aware that robert houdin was employed by the french government at one period of his career in a mission to algeria with the object of destroying if possible the popular belief in the pretended miracles of the marabouts whereby these latter had obtained an extraordinary ascendancy over the minds of the ignorant arabs the plan adopted was to show first that a european could perform still greater marvels and then to explain that these seeming mysteries were mere matters of science and dexterity and wholly independent of supernatural assistance the light and heavy chest was one of the prominent features of the program but if presented under that name it would have produced but very little effect the fact that the chest became immovable at command would only have been attributed by the arabs to some ingenious mechanical arrangement beyond their comprehension but exciting only a momentary wonder with great tact robert houdin contrived to turn the attention of his audience from the object to the subject of the trick professing not to make the chest light or heavy but to make the person who volunteered weak or strong at his pleasure thus presented the trick had the appearance no longer of a mere achievement of mechanical or scientific skill but of a manifestation of supernatural power we will tell the rest of the story as nearly as possible in robert houdin's own words as related in the story of his life an arab of middle stature but well knit wiry and muscular the very type of an arab hercules came forward with plenty of self-confidence and stood by my side are you very strong i inquired eyeing him from head to foot yes he replied carelessly are you sure that you will always remain so perfectly you are mistaken for in one moment i shall take away all your strength and leave you as weak as a little child the arab smiled scornfully in token of disbelief here i said lift up this chest the arab stooped lifted the chest and said disdainfully 
Is that all? Wait a bit, I replied. Then with the solemnity appropriate to my assumed character, I made a gesture of command and gravely said, You are weaker than a woman. Try now to lift that box. The strong man, perfectly indifferent about my magic spell, again catches hold of the box by the handle and gives a vigorous pull to lift it. This time, however, the chest resists, and in spite of the most determined efforts, remains absolutely immovable. The Arab wastes in vain over the unlucky chest an amount of force which would have lifted an enormous weight, till at last, exhausted, panting, and burning with shame, he ceases, looks dumbfoundered, and begins to appreciate the power of the magic art. He has half a mind to give up the attempt, but to give up would be to acknowledge himself conquered, and to admit his weakness, and after having been famed for his muscular strength, to sink to the level of a child. The bare idea makes him furious. Gathering new strength from the encouragement which his friends offer him by word and look, he casts towards them a glance which seems to say, You shall see what the son of the desert can do. Once more he bends over the chest, his nervous hands grip the handle, and his legs, planted one on each side of the chest like two columns of bronze, serve as a fulcrum for the mighty effort which he is about to make. It seems almost impossible, but that under such a strain the box must fly to pieces. Strange! This Hercules, a moment ago so strong and self-confident, now bends his head. His arms, riveted to the box, are drawn by a violent muscular contraction against his chest. His legs quiver, and he falls on his knees with a cry of agony. An electric shock, produced by an induction coil, had just been communicated, at a signal from me, from behind the scenes to the handle of the chest, thence the contortions of the unlucky Arab. To prolong his agony would have been inhuman. I gave a second signal, and the electric current was cut off. My athletic friend, released from his terrible bondage, raised his hands above his head. Allah! Allah! he cried, shaking with fright, then wrapping himself hastily in the folds of his burnus, as though to hide his disgrace, he rushed through the spectators and made his way to the door of the hall. To describe completely the induction coil above referenced to would be beyond the scope of the present treatise. It may, however, be summarily described as consisting of a coil of insulated copper wire, wound round a small bundle of straight iron wires, say five or six inches in length, and an inch in diameter. This is called the primary coil. Round this is again wound a quantity of much finer wire, also insulated. This constitutes the secondary coil. The ends of each coil are kept free. If a current of electricity be made to circulate through the wire of the primary coil, an independent current of great intensity is found to be thereby produced, by a mysterious process called induction, in the secondary coil. This current is strongest at the moment of first completing the circuit in the primary wire, and if a person is grasping the ends of the secondary wire, or any conducting substance in connection with it, at the moment when the circuit is completed, he will receive a very severe shock. A contrivance is attached to the coil, whereby the circuit is made and broken alternately with great rapidity, thereby producing a continuous shock of such power that the victim loses for the time being the faculty of relaxing his muscles, and is compelled, after the manner of the unfortunate Arab, to grip tighter and tighter the cause of his pain, until released by the final severing of the circuit. Any reader who desires a more complete acquaintance with the induction coil should purchase a little shilling manual entitled Intensity Coils, How Made and How Used by Dyer, Souter Alexander and Company, Cheapside, where he will find an excellent account of this interesting subject. Spirit Wrapping This deception is frequently performed by the aid of electromagnetism, although the wraps may be, and in most instances are, produced by much simpler methods. We will suppose that a table is to be the instrument of the wraps. The top being removed, a hollow is made in the frame which supports it, 
and in the cavity thus made is fixed an electromagnet of the fashion shown in figures 304 305 upon one side of the horseshoe at the centre of the curve is screwed a brass ring a to the opposite end of which is attached the keeper b the effect of the spring is to hold the keeper about a quarter of an inch away from the poles of the magnet save when a current of electricity is made to pass through the wire when the horseshoe becoming magnetic the keeper in spite of the resistance of the spring is brought down sharply into contact with the poles and so remains until the circuit is again severed when it flies back again to its former position the little metal knob or hammer c which is to produce the wraps is screwed to the under side of the keeper and points between the two arms or poles of the magnet if therefore the magnet be fastened to a piece of wood or other hard surface and an electric current be sent through the wire the keeper is instantly drawn down to the poles of the magnet and the hammer moving with it strikes the wood between the poles and produces the wrap as soon as the circuit is broken the keeper and hammer are raised by the spring in readiness for another wrap and each time that connection with the battery is made a wrap is produced the wires from the concealed magnet are made to pass down the leg of the table and beneath the door or carpet to the hiding place of the assistant who can thus summon spirits from the vasty deep or elsewhere at his pleasure it will be found a very convenient arrangement to have the magnet enclosed in a little mahogany box as shown in the diagrams in which condition it can be readily fixed in any required position the magic bell precisely the same in principle though differing somewhat in detail is the magic bell the bell which is of glass and of the form shown in figure three hundred six is hung up above the stage by two silk or woolen cords and thus apparently placed wholly out of reach of human influence nevertheless at the command of the magician it becomes endowed with seeming vitality the hammer strikes any number of times at command answers questions with three raps for yes and one for no after the approved spiritualistic manner indicates chosen cards and generally displays a remarkable amount of intelligence the reader who has followed our description of the spirit wrapping magnet will hardly require an explanation of the magic bell the brass cap from which the hammer projects contains a small electromagnet the wire which carries the hammer being fixed to the keeper and bringing the hammer down smartly on the glass whenever the electric circuit is made complete but says the sagacious reader how is the circuit made complete in the former case there were hidden wires passing through the legs of the table to convey the electric current but in this instance the bell is suspended in mid-air by a couple of ordinary cords how can the electric fluid therefore be conveyed to the bell the answer lies in the fact that the cords are not quite ordinary cords in appearance they are two pieces of common cord with a brass hook at each end for the purpose of first attaching them to corresponding hooks in the ceiling and secondly attaching the bell to their opposite ends but on a closer examination it will be found that a fine copper wire extends from hook to hook through the centre of the cord making it a perfect conductor while yet not diminishing in the least its perfect flexibility the hooks in the ceiling communicate with hidden wires and these with the electric battery behind the scenes the crystal cash box this is a mahogany box with glass top and bottom the wooden portion of it being lined with velvet see figure three hundred seven in dimensions it is about eight inches long by six wide and three and a half deep and it has a brass ring at either end the performer commences by borrowing say eight half crowns the owner of each being requested to mark it for the purpose of identification with these the performer exhibits any trick whose leading feature is the passage of the coin from some one place to another the trick having been performed and the money identified the operator still retaining it returns to the stage and placing the coins upon the table addresses the audience to the following effect 
ladies and gentlemen i have given you a slight specimen of the certainty and speed with which i can make money travel who would go to the trouble and expense of post office orders when by simply taking the money in his hand and saying pass he might make it fly direct into the pocket of his correspondent but i will give you another and a still more surprising illustration here the assistant brings in the crystal cash box here is a wooden box closed on all sides but with glass top and bottom so that you may see for yourselves that there is no mechanism or preparation about it now i propose to pass these eight half crowns the identical half crowns marked by yourselves into this closed box where shall i place the box so as to be at a distance from me and at the same time in full view of all present perhaps the best thing i can do with it will be to fasten it to these two silk cords hanging from the ceiling i will set the box swinging he does so so that you can all see that it is empty now i will take the money and stand in any part of the room you like he walks to the chosen spot will someone oblige me by counting three in a distinct voice one of the spectators does so and the performer at the last word makes the motion of throwing the money towards the cash box in which it is instantly seen and heard to fall his hand at the same moment appearing empty the cash box is taken down and the money returned to the owners who identify it as that which they had marked as the reader will doubtless have anticipated the coins are already in the cash box when the latter is hung to the cords they are concealed by a movable flap lying close against one of the wooden sides in which position it is maintained by a spring until an electric current is dispatched along the cords this brings into action an electromagnet hidden in the thickness of the box thereby causing the flap to be momentarily lifted and the coins to escape into the interior of the box when the performer having exhibited the preliminary trick with the borrowed coins places them apparently upon the table he in reality exchanges them and places the substitutes on the money trap described at page four hundred forty six leaving the genuine coins within reach of his assistant who forthwith carries them off behind the scenes and places them in readiness under the flap of the cash box the performer having attached the box to the cords and set it in motion apparently picks up the heap of coins which really sink into the table footnote if his table is not provided with the money trap the performer may really pick up the coins with his left hand and thence by the tourniquet apparently take them in the right keeping the right hand closed as if containing them while the attention of the spectators is thus drawn to the right hand the left may fall carelessly to the side and deposit the coins in the pochette and footnote when the word three is spoken he opens the right hand which is seen empty and the assistant behind the scenes taking the same word as a signal presses the connecting stud and completes the circuit the flap is momentarily lifted and the borrowed coins are heard and seen to fall within the box there is another box the invention of robert houdin which goes by the same name and with still better title inasmuch as not only the top and bottom but the sides and ends are of glass held together by a light metal framework in appearance it is as shown in figure three hundred eight and being transparent throughout it appears physically impossible that any object should be concealed in it and yet when the box is suspended and set swinging the operator has only to take the supposed borrowed coins in his hand and to pronounce the mystic pass when the eight half crowns are seen and heard to fall into the box and may be taken from thence by the owners themselves without even this near inspection of the apparatus revealing the secret of their appearance as in the trick we have just described electricity is the motive agent but in this instance it operates not by its magnetic influence but by another of its mysterious properties if a tolerably powerful current be made to pass at some point in its circuit through a short length say half an inch of fine platinum wire platinum being a bad conductor the wire will at the moment of completing the circuit be heated to a white heat 
or if the current be very powerful will even be fused together a very few words will show how this simple scientific fact is made available to produce the desired result the box measures about ten inches in length by five in breadth and five in depth so that its back front top and bottom are of exactly the same size on the top which slides out in order to give access to the interior is an ornamental design measuring about four inches by three this renders this particular portion of the top or lid opaque and it is beneath this portion that the half crowns are placed slips of glass are cemented to the underside of the lid see figure three hundred nine so as to enclose a space just large enough to allow eight half crowns to be placed in two layers of four each within it the slips of glass serve to keep the coins in position laterally vertically they are supported as follows the front of the box i e the side which when the box is suspended is nearest to the spectators is made double the outer portion is a fixture but the inner is attached by hinges a a to the upper edge of the box and may therefore be folded at pleasure against the top though when released it falls back to its normal position against the front in which position it is secured by a spring catch until again raised it is upon this movable side thus folded up against the top that the eight half crowns are supported the opposite edge of the top of the box is arranged as follows b b is a metal tube with an opening of about half an inch in length between d d c c are two metal hooks or rings by which the apparatus is suspended and through which the current passes each of these communicates with a piece of insulated copper wire extending from c to d the space between d d is filled up by a round plug or pencil of wood see enlarged view in figure three hundred ten along which lies a small piece of very fine platinum wire e e connecting the ends of the two copper wires the movable glass flap is held up against the top by means of a little piece of black cotton f which passing through a minute hole in the outer edge of the flap is made to pass around the wooden plug and thus to cross the platinum wire at right angles and in immediate contact with it the practical application of the scientific principle to which we have alluded will now be obvious at the moment of completing the circuit the platinum becoming red hot instantly severs the cotton when down falls the flap not altering in the least the general appearance of the box but allowing the half crowns to fall loose into its interior in order to prepare the apparatus for use it is necessary first to remove the sliding lid to place the movable flap in position and to fasten it with cotton as already described the lid should then be turned upside down and the half crowns placed in position after which the box also is turned upside down and the lid allowed to slide gently into its place the half crowns are now secure and the box may be brought forward and set swinging without any danger of their making a premature appearance in some boxes the double flap is omitted the front being single but movable and working as already explained in this case the box when first brought forward has the glass of the side towards the audience missing but at a little distance its absence cannot be detected end of section fifty section fifty one of modern magic this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Blaisley Dragon. Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring, by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Stage Tricks, Part 6. The Magic Drum. This is, in appearance, an ordinary side drum but being hung up by cords from the ceiling, it will forthwith, without any visible drumsticks, give either a single rap or a roll, or keep time to any piece of music. It will further answer questions and tell fortunes, indicate chosen cards, etc., after the manner of the magic bell, 
These mysterious effects are produced by two hammers or drumsticks, fixed against one end of the drum on the inside. Each of these is attached to the keeper of an electromagnet, but there is a difference in the mode of their working. One works after the manner of the bell, giving a single tap whenever contact is made, but henceforth remaining silent until the circuit is again broken and again completed. In other words, each pressure of the connecting stud produces one rap, and no more. The second hammer is differently arranged. By means of what is called a contact breaker, the movement of the keeper, when attracted by the magnet, of itself breaks the circuit. The circuit being broken, the iron is no longer magnetic and the keeper flies back to its old position, thereby once more completing the circuit. As long as the pressure on the stud continues, therefore, the circuit is alternatively made and broken in rapid succession, involving a corresponding movement of the keeper and hammer, and producing a roll of the drum. The use of the two hammers involves the necessity of two electrical circuits and two connecting studs, and of the three cords to suspend the drum, one being common to both circuits. With a little practice in the management of the two studs, the single wrapper may be made to beat time to a tune, while the other stud brings in the roll at appropriate intervals. There are some drums, of an inferior character, made with one hammer only, such hammer being arranged for the roll. Where it is desired to give a single rap, this may be effected by pressing and instantly releasing the stud with a light, quick touch, but some little dexterity is required. In the case of all these applications, for magically answered questions, it is necessary that the assistant who has the control of the apparatus should be in such a position as to distinctly hear the question asked. In fortune-telling matters, the answer may generally be left to his own discretion, but for indicating what card is chosen, etc., it is necessary either that an agreed card be forced or that a carefully arranged code of verbal signals should be employed, whereby the form of the question may itself indicate the proper answer. Considerable fun may be caused by the magician selecting an evidently engaged couple, and after asking how many months it will be before they are married, etc., inquiring in a stage whisper how many children they are destined to be blessed with. The drum wraps steadily up to, say, five, and this is accepted as the answer when, after a moment's pause, two more raps are heard in quick succession. This alarming omen is received with general laughter, amid which the drum gives another rap, and then another, continuing until the performer, scandalized at its behavior, unhooks it from the cords and carries it, still rapping, off the stage. This last effect is wholly independent of electricity, being produced by the performer tapping with his fingers that end of the drum which for the time being is furthest from the audience. There are some few other tricks performed by the aid of electricity, but anyone who understands the principle of those above described may make a very shrewd guess at the working of the reminder. All tricks of this class, though ingenious and effective, are open to one of two serious objections. In the first place, the apparatus is very costly, and secondly, they are unpleasantly liable, from the nicety of their mechanism and the absolute necessity of perfect electrical connection in all their parts, to hang fire at the critical moment and leave the operator in a very embarrassing position. Imagine the feelings of a performer who, having just introduced his wonderful drum, which is to display unheard of oracle powers, finds that the instrument remains as mute as the celebrated harp in Tara's hall, and refuses to bear out, in the smallest degree, his grandiloquent assertions. Yet this unpleasant result may occur at any time from the simple breaking of a wire, or some even slighter cause. This, it appears to us, is a serious drawback to electrical tricks, though, where they are exhibited at their best, no illusions are more beautiful or have more of a genuine magic about them. We should mention before quitting the subject of these tricks that in order to avoid the trouble and expense of fixing the necessary conducting wires in a building not specially appropriated to magical performances, an upright brass rod, which may be detached at pleasure, 
is sometimes fitted on each side of the performer's table, see figure 311, and the apparatus in use, drum, bell, cash box, etc., is suspended by appropriate cords between these rods. The conducting wires are connected within the table with the lower ends of the brass uprights, and thence pass down its hinder legs to the battery behind the scenes. There are many considerations of convenience in favor of this arrangement, but the tricks performed are less effective than where the apparatus is hung fairly from the ceiling and apparently out of all possible reach of mechanical influence. The Aerial Suspension This is a very old trick performed originally by the Indian jugglers, who kept the modus operandi a profound secret. The ingenuity, however, of Robert Howden penetrated the mystery, and in 1849 he made it a special feature of his seances fantastiques. At that time the public mind was much interested in the aesthetic qualities of ether, which had then recently been discovered. Robert Howden manipulated this fact into a valuable advertisement. He gave out that he had discovered in the popular anesthetic a still more marvelous property, viz. that when inhaled under certain conditions, it neutralized the attraction of gravitation in the person inhaling it, who became for the time being light as air. In proof of this, he brought forward his youngest son, then a child of ten, or thereabouts, and after having made him smell a small vial, really empty, but supposed to contain ether, caused him to recline in mid-air, with no other support than that afforded by, to all appearances, an ordinary walking stick, placed in a vertical position under his right elbow. It is characteristic of Robert Howden's minute attention to the mis en scene of a trick, that while his son sniffed at the empty bottle, his assistant, behind the scenes, poured genuine ether upon a hot shovel, so that the fumes, reaching the nostrils of the audience, might prove indirectly but convincingly that ether was really employed. After the retirement of Robert Howden from the stage, the trick fell comparatively out of notice, till it was revived in a new form by Fakir of Ulu, Professor Sylvester in England, and contemporaneously by D. Vera on the continent. A full-grown young lady was in this case the subject of the illusion, and was made, while still suspended in air, to assume various costumes and characters. The illusion in this new form took the fancy of the public, and brought forth a host of imitators, but few have presented it with the same completeness as the two performers named. For a time, it produced quite a marked sensation. Equal crowds thronging to see Sylvester in London, and de Vere in Paris, St. Petersburg, Brussels, Peth, Dresden, Strasbourg, and other continental cities. Recent mechanical improvements to which the last-named professor has materially contributed have greatly heightened the effect of the trick, the lady being made to rise spontaneously from the perpendicular to the horizontal position, and to continue to float in the air after her last ostensible support has been removed. Apart from these special mysteries, which we are not at liberty to reveal, the trick is as follows. The performer brings forward the girl or boy who is to be the subject of the illusion, and who is dressed in some fancy costume. A low bench or table, say five feet in length, by two in width, and on legs about six inches in height, is brought forward and shown to be wholly disconnected from the floor or stage. On this is placed a small stool on which the subject of the experiment, whom in the present instance will be supposed to be a young lady, mounts. She extends her arms, and under each is placed a stout rod or pole of appropriate length. See figure 312. The performer makes pretended mesmeric passes over her, and in a minute or two her head is seen to droop, and after a few more passes her eyes close, and she is, to all external appearances, in a mesmeric sleep. The operator now takes the stool from under her feet, when she hangs suspended between the two rods. Again, a few more passes, and the operator removes the rod that supports the left arm, and gently mesmerizes the arm down to the side. Still, the girl hangs motionless, 
and with no other support than the single upright rod on which her right arm rests. See figure 313. The operator now drapes her in various costumes, still keeping up from time to time the supposed mesmeric passes. Bending her right arm so as to support her head, he next lifts her gently to an angle of 45 degrees to the upright rod, as shown by the dotted line in figure 313, and finally raises her to a horizontal position as in figure 314. An inspection of the diagrams will already have furnished the clue to the mysteries. Of the two upright rods, one, that is placed under the left arm, is wholly without preparation, and may be freely handed for examination. The other, A, is either of iron throughout, this was the case with the pretended walking stick used by Robert Howden, or of well-seasoned wood with an iron core and capable of bearing a very heavy weight. The lower end of this sinks into a socket in the low board or table already mentioned, and thus becomes for the time being a fixture. In the upper end is hollowed out a small space about an inch in depth for the purpose of which will presently appear. The subject of the experiment wears, underneath her page's costume, a sort of iron corset or framework similar to that shown in figure 313 and 314, and more in detail in figure 315. An iron girdle, A, a passes nearly round the waist, the circle being completed by a leather strap. At right angles to this, on the right side, is fixed an iron upright, B, extending from just below the armpit, nearly to the knee, but with a joint, C, working backwards and forwards only. At the hip, a strap, D, round the leg, keeping it in position so as to allow of bending the thigh. From the back of the iron girdle, in the center, proceeds a crutch, E, also of iron, passing between the legs and connected with the girdle, front and rear. A fourth strap, F, constructed with the girdle in front and rear, passes over the left shoulder and prevents any risk of the apparatus slipping downwards. To the upper part of the upright, B, immediately below the armpit, is riveted a short flat piece of iron, G, working freely upon it. The end of G, which forms the joint shown enlarged in figure 316, is welded into a semicircular ratchet with three teeth corresponding with a check H lying parallel with B, and which in its normal position is pressed up closely into the teeth of the ratchet by a spring, but may be withdrawn by a downward pressure on the hook I. The opposite end of G has projecting from its underside at right angles an iron plug, J, which just fits into the cavity before mentioned in the top of the rod, A. There is an opening in the under part of the sleeve to give passage to this plug, which when inserted in the corresponding cavity of A makes G relatively to it a fixture. The remainder of the iron framework, and with it the lady, remains movable to the extent that, by means of the joint at G, it can be made to describe an arc of 90 degrees to the upright rod. The mode of operation will be clear. When the young lady mounts on the stool and extends her arms, the performer, in placing the upright beneath them, takes care to let the lower end of A sink properly into the socket, and to adapt the plug J to the cavity at top. The apparatus is now in the position shown in figure 313, and when the stool is removed, the lady is left apparently resting only on A, but in reality comfortably seated in her iron cage, the different parts of which are carefully padded so as to occasion her no discomfort. Her legs and arms, being quite free, may be placed in any position that the performer chooses, and when presently he lifts her into a slanted position, as shown by the dotted line in figure 313, the check drops into the second tooth of the ratchet and thus maintains her in that position. 
after a short interval she is lifted into the horizontal position as in figure 314 when the check drops into the third tooth of the ratchet and so maintains her apparently sleeping upon an aerial couch as the support terminates above the right knee the legs are kept extended by muscular power this attitude is therefore very fatiguing and for that reason cannot be continued for more than a few moments to replace the lady in the upright position the performer places both hands under the recumbent figure the left hand easily finding through the tunic and drawing down the hook eye thereby withdrawing the check and allowing the lady to sink down gently to the perpendicular the stool is again placed under her feet and the second upright under her left arm before the operator begins to demesmerize her which he does after the orthodox fashion with reverse passes the lady simulating as best she may the bewildered and half scared expression of one newly awakened from a mesmeric trance end of section 51 Recording by Blazely Dragon. Section fifty two of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Modern Magic A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring. By Professor Louis Hoffman. Section 52 Concluding Observations. It now only remains to give the neophyte a few parting hints of general application. In getting up any trick, even the simplest, the first task of the student should be to carefully read and consider the instructions given, and to make quite certain that he perfectly comprehends their meaning. This being ascertained, the next point will be to see whether the trick involves any principle of sleight of hand in which he is not thoroughly proficient, and if it does, to set to work and practice diligently till the difficulty is conquered. Having thus mastered the elements of the trick, he should next attack it as a whole, and in like manner practice, 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 till from beginning to end he can work each successive step of the process with ease and finish having achieved thus much he may perhaps consider that his task is at an end by no means being perfect in the mechanical portion of the illusion he must now devote himself to its dramatic element which as regards the effect upon the spectator is by far the more important portion the performer should always bear in mind that he fills the character of a person possessing supernatural powers and should endeavour in every word and gesture to enter into the spirit of his part as the true actor playing hamlet will endeavour actually to be hamlet for the time so the soi disant magician must in the first place learn to believe in himself when he steps upon the stage he should for the time being persuade himself that his fictitious power is a reality and that the wand he holds is not only the emblem but the actual implement of his power every time he pronounces the mystic pass or touches an object with his wand to effect some pretended transformation he should force himself to forget the commonplace expedients by which the result is really attained and to believe that the effect is produced by the genuine magical process when he goes through the motion of passing a coin from the right hand to the left he should have imagination enough to persuade himself for the moment that the coin has really been transferred as it appears to be if a performer has sufficient imaginative faculty to do this if he can so enter into the spirit of his part as himself to believe in the marvels he professes he will achieve an almost unlimited mastery over the imaginations of his audience as we have already intimated each individual illusion should have its appropriate words and gestures in technical language its patter or boniment carefully arranged and rehearsed so as to produce the maximum of effect these are in truth the very life of the trick how much depends on mise en scene is forcibly illustrated by the account which we quoted in the last chapter 
from the life of Robert Houdin, of his exhibition in Algeria of the light and heavy chest. We will borrow from the same high authority another illustration, purposely selecting one of the simplest of card tricks, the well-known feat of picking out a chosen card from the pack placed in a person's pocket. The trick has already been described in outline, but we will recapitulate its effect in a few words. The performer offers the pack to a spectator and requests him to draw a card. This card may or may not be forced. The card having been drawn and replaced in the pack, the performer makes the pass to bring it to the top and palms it, immediately handing the pack to be shuffled. If the card was forced, he already knows it. If not, he takes the opportunity to glance at it while the cards are being shuffled. The pack being returned, the drawn card is placed on the top, and the pack placed in the pocket of a second spectator. The performer now announces that he not only already knows the card, but that he is able to pick it out without seeing it from the remainder of the pack, which he does accordingly. Presented in this barren form, the trick would attract only the most passing notice. We will now proceed to describe it, quoting again from Robert Houdin, as it should actually be presented. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall commence my performance with an experiment which is wholly independent of dexterity. I propose simply to show you the extreme degree of sensibility which may be acquired by the sense of touch. We possess, as you will know, five senses, sight, hearing, smell, touch, and taste. In the ordinary way, each of these senses enjoys one faculty only. But when the mysterious influences of magic are brought to bear, the case is altered. All five of the senses may be exercised through the instrumentality of one, touch, for example. So that we can not only touch, but hear, see, smell, and taste with the tips of our fingers. You smile, gentlemen, but I assure you that I am serious, and I venture to think that in a few minutes you will be fully convinced of the reality of the singular fact which I have mentioned. Here is a pack of cards. Madam, will you be kind enough to take whichever card you please? Hold it for a moment between your hands so as to impregnate it with the mesmeric influence of your touch, and then replace it in the middle of the pack. In order to exclude all possibility of sleight of hand, we will now thoroughly shuffle the cards, after which, for still greater certainty, I will show you that the card is neither at top nor bottom, whence you may be persuaded that it is placed just where chance has chosen to put it. For the purpose of showing that the card is neither at top nor bottom, it may either be left second from the top, after the shuffle, if executed by the performer himself, or being actually placed on the top, the second card may be drawn instead of the first by means of a tillage. Will some gentleman now have the kindness to empty his breast pocket, and allow me to place the pack in it? This is done. Now that the cards are placed in perfect darkness, I will endeavour, by virtue of that five-fold sensibility of touch which I have just mentioned, to discover by the aid of my fingers only the card which this lady drew. To make my task still more difficult, I will undertake to draw the card at such number as you yourself may choose. What number shall it be? We will suppose that the reply is seventh. Seventh. Be it so. Then six times in succession I must avoid taking the drawn card, and produce it on the seventh occasion only. One, two, three, four, five, six. He exhibits six cards one by one, taking them from the bottom of the pack. Now, to find the lady's card. Yes, I think I have it. Before taking it out, I will read it with my little finger, which is the cleverest of the five. Yes, it is not a small card. It is not a club, nor a spade, nor yet a diamond. It is the king of... He draws out the card and places it face downwards. Will you be good enough? madam to finish naming the card before i turn it over and we shall see whether my little finger has been correct in its assertions the lady names the king of hearts which the performer forthwith turns up my little finger was right you see 
will you be good enough sir to take the remainder of the cards out of your pocket and testify that the experiment has really been performed exactly as i stated the above example will show how by the exercise of a little tact and ingenuity a simple piece of parlor magic may be elevated to the dignity of a stage trick the great secret is the directing of the minds of the audience into such a channel that the denouement for the moment seems to be a natural result of the causes artfully suggested by the performer this may to a considerable extent be effected as in the example above given by the language and gesture of the performer in the individual trick but still more may be done by the artistic grouping of one trick with another a comparatively simple feat being employed to prepare the minds of the spectators for the greater marvel to follow thus in the recent performances of the fakir of ulu the aerial suspension which performed the staple of his program was preceded by the exhibition of a wooden rod or wand which by means of certain projecting wire points so minute as to be imperceptible at a very short distance was made to defy the laws of gravity by clinging to his fingertips in various positions without visible support this minor illusion being somewhat similar in effect though wholly different as to the means employed prepared the minds of the audience to receive the greater marvel of a living woman made to recline in mid-air in like manner the trick of the flying money forms an apt preparation for the introduction of the crystal cash box the series of tricks described under the title of birth of flowers affords another instance of the artistic combination of two or three different tricks in such manner as to enhance the effect of the whole but in truth examples might be multiplied ad infinitum in arranging an entertainment the performer should continually bear this principle in mind the program should consist not of a number of absolutely unconnected tricks but of a series of ten or a dozen groups of tricks as compared with each other the groups should have as much diversity as possible but individually each should consist of the same or similar effect repeated in a more and more striking form though produced by different means or else of a string of tricks united by some natural sequence as in the case of the production of the two rabbits from the same hat followed by the rolling of the one into the other and terminating with the reproduction of the vanished animal in another quarter in order to make our meaning clearer we subjoin a specimen working program arranged on the principles we have stated program for performers own use one vanishing gloves transformed handkerchief handkerchief ultimately found in candle two borrowed half crown changed to penny and back again made to pass into centre of two oranges in succession three more half crowns borrowed and all four made to pass invisibly from performer's hand to goblet at a distance and finally into crystal cash box three shower of sweets produced from borrowed handkerchief followed by bird cages then bowls of goldfish from shawl four eggs produced from mouth of assistant wizard's omelette dove wrapped in paper and vanished five chosen card picked out of a pack placed in a spectator's pocket chosen card caught on sword the rising cards six borrowed watch made to bend backwards and forwards made to strike the hour as a repeater placed in pistol and fired at target seven the chinese rings eight rabbits produced from borrowed hat one rolled into the other and subsequently found in bran glass multiplying balls and cannonballs produced from hat nine inexhaustible box producing toys reticules and finally chinese lanterns the above with proper mise-en-scene will be found an ample program for a two hours entertainment it is hardly necessary to observe that the program of the same entertainment for distribution among the audience would be of a very different character this is always drawn up in the vaguest possible terms so as not to reveal beforehand the actual effect of the different tricks thus the tricks in question will be described somewhat as follows 
program for distribution one the enchanted handkerchief two the flying coins three a succession of surprises four the fairy omelette five the cabalistic cards six the mesmerized watch seven the chinese rings eight the bewitched hat nine the feast of lanterns between each of the items above mentioned there should be an interval of one or two minutes filled up by music while the operator leaves the stage and makes the necessary preparation for the next trick it will further be found an advantage where practicable to divide the entertainment into two parts with an interval of ten minutes or so between them the curtain being let down during such interval the few minutes break is always acceptable to the audience who are apt to become fatigued by too long protracted attention and is especially valuable to the performer as enabling him to rearrange his servante removing articles that have served their purpose and replacing them by such as may be needed for the tricks to come an overcrowded servante is a fertile source of annoyance and failure and an article accidentally falling from it reveals the existence of a receptacle behind the table and therefore deprives the performance of half its effect when a rearrangement of the servante between the parts of the performance is impracticable it is well if any tricks involving the production of articles from this quarter are included in the program to introduce such tricks as early as possible so that the servante may be relieved of such articles and left clear for its second use of getting rid of articles upon it we have known a professor performing the flying glass of water trick and in placing the glass on the servante knock down a cannonball placed there to be introduced later on into a hat that cannonball weighed on the professor's mind for the rest of the evening and the performance was practically spoilt having arranged his program and the appropriate patter for each group of tricks the performer should conclude his practice by a series of three or four dress rehearsals with an intelligent friend to play the part of audience and who should be invited to criticize with the utmost freedom at these rehearsals there should be no make-believe but each trick should be worked throughout with the same completeness in every particular with which it is afterwards to be exhibited in public in the course of these final rehearsals the performer should tax his invention to see what amount of incidents or by-play he can introduce into the course of the different tricks thus at the commencement of his entertainment the trick of the flower in the buttonhole or that of the vanishing gloves may be introduced not professedly as an item of the program but as a little preliminary flourish again if the performer has occasion for an egg or lemon in the course of a trick it greatly enhances the effect if instead of having the necessary article brought in by his assistant he produces it himself from a lady's muff or from the whiskers of a male spectator these little matters though small in themselves tend to keep alive the attention of the audience and to create a sort of magical atmosphere which will aid materially in disposing the spectators to receive with due respect the occult pretensions of the performer with respect to stage arrangements the professional performing evening after evening with full provision of stage appliances will quickly learn by experience how best to arrange those appliances for the purpose of his entertainment but the amateur performing only occasionally and in places not specially adapted for magical purposes may be glad of some little practical counsel in this particular we will suppose for instance that he is called upon to give a magical seance in a private drawing-room the first point is to decide which part of the room is to form the stage having settled this the seats for the spectators should be arranged at the opposite end of the room leaving as wide a space between as can well be obtained as many changes etc are effected during the journey from the audience to the table and the longer this journey is the more time is available for the necessary manipulations at the stage end the table will be the principal feature and either behind or beside this should be placed a screen of not less than six feet in height and four or five wide to serve as behind the scenes and to afford the cover necessary for the various preparations supposing a regular screen is not available one must 
be extemporized a large clothes horse with a curtain thrown over it will answer the purpose very well if however the drawing-room be of the regular london fashion i e consisting of a large front and small back room connected by folding doors the screen may be dispensed with and the rooms arranged as in figure 317 which represents a ground plan of two such rooms with the adjoining staircase and landing the larger room a will form the auditorium and the smaller room b the stage a and b representing the doors leading to the landing and c the folding doors between the two rooms the folding doors which act as curtains being first closed the spectators are marshalled into a and requested to take their seats and the door b is then closed to remain so throughout the entertainment the room b is arranged as follows the table d is placed in the centre towards the back with its servante properly arranged this may either stand alone or may be supplemented by a couple of side tables e an ordinary table f should be placed outside the door and upon this will be laid in due order the various pieces of apparatus and other articles which will be required in the course of the entertainment a working program should be kept on this table for the use of the performer and his assistant with a note of the articles required for the purpose of each trick this will enable them to have everything ready at the right moment without delay or confusion the door a should be kept open so that the assistant from his place by the table f can instantly see and hear what is wanted when the performer has made his bow to the audience there are still one or two little points that he will do well to bear in mind they may be summarized as follows one don't be nervous the reader may possibly consider that this is a matter in which he has no choice but nothing could be a greater mistake a little diffidence is excusable on the first presentation of a new program but never afterwards two take your time deliver your boniment like an actor playing his part and not like a schoolboy repeating his lesson further give your audience time to see and appreciate your movements young performers are very apt to exhibit the second phase of a transformation without having sufficiently indicated the first to the spectators the change of say an orange to an apple falls decidedly flat if nobody noticed that the article was an orange in the first place three don't make any parade of dexterity and don't affect any unusual quickness in your movements if you are about to vanish a coin don't play shuttlecock with it from hand to hand as a preliminary but make the necessary pass as quickly and deliberately as you possibly can don't talk about the quickness of the hand deceiving the eye and still less do anything to support such an idea the perfection of conjuring lies in the ars artem theendi and sending away the spectators persuaded that sleight of hand has not been employed at all and unable to suggest any solution of the wonders they have seen four don't force yourself to be funny if you are naturally humorous so much the better but in any case perform in your natural character five avoid personalities we accept the case of the often recurring nuisance the gentleman who professes to know how everything is done and whose special endeavor it is to embarrass the performer when you can make a person of this kind look like a fool by no means a difficult task by all means do so six never plead guilty to a failure keep your wits about you and if anything goes wrong try to save your credit by bringing the trick to some sort of a conclusion even though it be a comparatively weak one if you are so unfortunate as to experience a complete and unmistakable breakdown smile cheerfully and ascribe the fiasco to the moon being in a wrong quarter to a little misunderstanding between two of your controlling spirits or any other burlesque reason so long as it be sufficiently remote from the true one bearing in mind these parting counsels and thus armed against failure as well as prepared for success you may safely ring up the curtain and begin to witch the world with the marvels and mysteries of modern magic End of section 52
End of Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Louis Hoffman.